In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's nice to see a, a large crew here this evening. I thought most of you would be out uh, school shopping and getting ready for the start of the school year. But we're glad we have a lot here and welcome the people at home that are listening. We're going to start off. The first thing on the agenda tonight is to sign the state primary warrant. And I think we have a motion to do that. Mr. Chairman, I move to sign the September 4th, 2018 state primary warrant. Second. I have a motion second by Mr. Schultz. Any discussion? Mr. Gilberto? Uh, Constable is here. Mr. Furiello, thank you for joining us tonight. Okay. No other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. You witness that? Okay. Yeah. Close enough. Okay, next on the agenda is this evening we have a wonderful opportunity to recognize a member of the Board of Health. Uh, so Gary Hunt, if uh, I see you in the back of the room, if you wouldn't mind coming to the podium and maybe lead us off on this uh, agenda item this evening. Thank you, Mike. Yes, we have indeed a rare event this evening, uh, the changing of a guard on the Board of Health. I've been on the board for 32 years, actually. When I bought my house, the seller said that that was a requirement of the purchase and sale is that I take his position on the board, and I thought he was serious. Obviously, I did. Um, tonight, we want to honor Mike Rickey, who's a member of the board and has been for 25 years. Um, and he's going to be leaving us and eventually the town of North Reading. Uh, to bigger and better things, or perhaps uh, different things, let's put it that way. Um, and we really appreciate everything that Mike did while he was on the board. Uh, over that time, we actually became good friends. It's hard not to, to get friends with someone that you've worked with for 25 years. Um, so we'd like to honor Mike, and uh, if you want to come up and if you want to say a few words. Wow. <laughs> um, definitely, no question, it's been a, a privilege and an honor for me to have served the town on the Board of Health for the 25 plus years. Um, during that tenure, what can I say? I've had great, great staff that I've worked with, great board members. Like I said, I've known Gary for quite, quite some time. Uh, we did some coaching in basketball. Um, like I said, you get to be, you know, become friends with a lot of people, but great staff. Um, Oh, you know, not, not a big change over the years. But uh, during that time, I think, because of all the good, good things that we've done, I think, I think we did. I, hopefully I made uh, some difference in the town a little bit. We've had some tough meetings, some, some good meetings. But again, uh, bottom line, Board of Health is here to protect, to educate, and to promote, and to protect the citizens of North Reading. They're public health, that's, that's bottom line what it is. And I think uh, we've done a good job with that. Good people. Uh, I think I'm going to leave the board in good hands. Gary's still going to be here. Pam, we have Karen's going to be taking my place. And with the staff, uh, I'll have to be watching it from afar a little bit, but I'm going to miss it. There's no question about it. Uh, but I've met a lot of great people. We've worked with a lot of people here. You know, elected officials, police, fire, CIT. It's been, it's been great. I've gotten to meet a lot of people. So again, thank you for the opportunity, and I'm, I'm going to miss it. 
Tenía. Mr. Ritchie. Mr. Ritchie, we have a, a step of appreciation I'd like to read to you and, and present to you, but I wanted to give my board members, if anybody had anything they wanted to say real quick before I did that. Anybody? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, again, it's uh, many times, you know, Board of Health uh, provided tremendous function for the community, but most of the time under the radar. And uh, uh, for the most part, they do a, a very good job of uh, policing the community. They've had some good staff uh, to work for them over the years and health agents over the years uh, that Mike's been here. But one thing that's been tried and true is they've been very consistent in their application of uh, the rules and regulations. They've been sure to be uh, consistent and fair with everybody. Um, I've been to a few of the heat meetings over the years where there's been some heated discussions and um, some uh, compromises that, uh, that have taken place with, you know, they, they are there truly for the public's uh, health's best interest. Uh, they've worked very hard, and Mike, you've been uh, tireless and uh, quiet about it. We appreciate your service and uh, all the time that you've put in, and, and you've been a, a terrific uh, member of the board and a great public servant. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Messier. I'd like to comment on the basis that the town operates on volunteers, and there are a number of people that have been on committees for a long time, like Michael. And Michael, thank you for all of your time spent on the Board of Health. So without any further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity to provide you a certificate of appreciation. The Board of Selectmen of the Town of North Reading are pleased to present this remembrance of their high regard and appreciation to Michael Rickey in recognition of 25 years of faithful and conscientious service as a member of the Board of Health. So please come up. Chairman, through you, just yes. a couple of comments, uh, if I may. First, uh, um, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Health Director Bob Racy wanted to be here, is not able to be here this evening, but I know he appreciates his time working alongside uh, you, uh, Mr. Ricky, and then I also just want to welcome um, Karen Martin, who is here as well, who's taken the place for a term on the Board of Health. So if you want to stand up, Karen. I know you're known to many people, but congratulations. <laughs> thank the uh, the Board of Health for their, uh, their their role in identifying a successor uh, for Mike uh, along with Mr. Schultz who met with both the candidates who we're looking at um, we have fortunately we have two very interested candidates a second candidate who will also uh, hopefully be assisting the Board of Health in a, in, in another fashion uh, in the coming months so uh, more to come on that but again thank you very much for your efforts and welcome Karen thank you, thank you all board members appreciate it <laughs> is anyone here for public comment So good evening, uh, Eric Evans, 3 Sandra Lane. So it's been a busy uh, snow and ice summer, believe it or not. Um, on behalf of the chamber, um, I was asked to um, you know, talk to the business owners and, and garner support for uh, a citizen's petition to um, address the snow and ice bylaw. And it was very interesting. I went up and down Main Street, uh, tried to get signatures for the petition. And I realized a lot of, there's, there's a lot of unrepresentation going on. Uh, with the business owners because it was very hard to find people who actually lived in town that could sign the petition but i was able to get 50 signatures from from all the business owners around town but it just showed me more of a need that you know the chamber's there for a good reason to be able to advocate for those um, who can't advocate for themselves so um like i said we did file the uh, citizen's petition and it should be on the warrant i look forward to working with the board 
to um, to come up with a solution on the, the snow and ice situation. So, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, good evening, uh, Rich Walner, 57 Lakeside Boulevard, and also uh, representing the Social Services Action Team of the Community Impact Team. I've been chair of that, uh, that group, that volunteer group, for about the last five years. Our focus is, along with all of Community Impact Team, is to try to build a quality of life for all of our citizens. We have been naturally more inclined to be focused on the adults in town, because there's already a lot of youth effort that's going on. So, in, um, and part of, our, uh, part of our discussions over the last four or five years has been on the, now as we know, the Intergenerational Community Center. I think it was the combination of Lynn, you know, uh, the Parks and Rec coming together with Senior Services, plus Sue Magner of Vet Services and uh, Amy Luckwitz of Youth Services all came together in my group and we all kind of collectively agreed having a group that represented all those um, people would be a good thing to have. So uh, it was a pleasure to go in April to the wine festival and to the wine and tasting festival and Brad Jones came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, looks like we're gonna have some money coming for this. So that was really good to hear that this might actually happen because finding $10 million isn't so easy. Um, and then just recently we had a um, SSAT meeting and um, Lynn came in the room to say that she was gonna have a meeting immediately afterwards and wanted to know how we felt about the location of where this, this community center might be. And internally, we've had a discussion of whether it should be at Ipswich River Park or whether it should be in this kind of new community center, new downtown area that's been discussed you know, quite a bit um, in various departments actually in town. And so I told her, I'll just share with you what I said was that I think there's an argument for it to be made at Ipswich River Park and I think there's an argument for it to be made downtown. So um, it, assuming there is a new downtown and you know, um, and so from Lynn's point of view, she very clearly wants it at Ipswich River Park. If you talk to Mary Crunny, who represents a significant demographic in town, she would like it to be downtown. So um, I was a little, uh, hopefully that got through to you when you had your discussions. I was a little disappointed to see in the paper that really it was all about Ipswich River Park and that I didn't see anything about it potentially being located somewhere else. So all I'm asking is just as a courtesy, recognize that there is an open topic, you know, amongst within my own group and people outside the group that it may not belong in Ipswich River Park, that it may belong somewhere else. Um, this is a discussion that is being had within CPC because CPC is looking at like, the master plan and it's also a discussion that has been coming up in our advisory group that's part of that CPC putting together a master plan. Again, I'm not saying where it should be, I'm just saying it should be an open discussion. Hopefully our future discussions, especially those that hit the paper, are reflective that this is a very open topic. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And was there anyone else? Yes. You go. You have a. Uh, you got to get out of the camera, Phil. All right. Hi everyone, Phil Healy, uh, 110 Low Road. Um, I'm actually here to uh, talk about two items that are, or two events that are happening uh, with NORCAM. Uh, tomorrow at the Flint Memorial Library, we're having, I think, our fourth uh, cinematic conversations. It's actually a screening at the library in the activity room. It's a free movie. Uh, pretty much you can get there at 7 p.m. and you have a Boston area critic talk to you uh, about the movie a after it screams. Uh, this month will be the Ryan Gosling and Michelle Williams uh, vehicle. Uh, it's very tough to watch, I guess. It's not really the notebook, but you know, I want to attract people who think it is, so they get their heart broken. Uh, it's called uh, Blue Valentine, so I recommend coming for that tomorrow at 7. That's free. And we're also having, uh, NORCAM is having a seminar for people who are interested in covering events for the school and around town at the Distance Learning Lab on, I believe it's Thursday, August 30th at noon, and a week after, uh, Thursday, September 6th at 7 p.m. at the Distance Learning Lab. You can uh, check out more about that at NORCAM. Uh, org or facebook.com slash uh, norcam. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Hi, David Monahan, 42 Wilson Ave here in town. 
Um, I spoke at the last meeting also. I was here just to provide an additional update. Um, this is the start of the ninth week that we've been locked out at National Grid and we've all been going to the local towns continuing to ask for a moratorium um, while the inexperienced workers are out uh, completing our jobs. It, we're up to 18 cities and towns um, and we've had some run-ins which is the main reason that we're requesting this uh, moratorium. Um, local towns such as Burlington have had gas mains in an entire neighborhood marked out by these new subcontractors that are completing our job by 10 feet. Marked them out 10 feet in the wrong direction. A subcontractor that was doing sewer work ripped that out of the ground due to the inexperience and inaccuracy of the marks. Um, there's been a huge delay we've heard from a lot of the local um, DPWs as far as the dig safe contractor that the company's been using. Um, there hasn't been any meter changes, which is a state mandated um, requirement. The company hasn't been meeting that. So overall, we're just concerned for the towns that we live in. I live here in town. Um, I would be nervous to have somebody work in front of my house. Um, so I was again here asking that the, the board consider some form of a moratorium. I understand there are projects going on in town that have already been initiated and that you wouldn't want to tie those um, projects up. You know, that's an under, understanding thing. But as this moves forward, they may look to expand into towns that aren't stopping them from working and flood it with contractors that are from out of state, who knows what their experience level is, who knows what their qualification level is, and put the community at risk. So I just wanted to broach the topic again. I told you I, at the last meeting I would check back in. I sent you all some um, slides and letters um, in an email, and I just wanted to touch base again. Well, we, I had asked the town administrator at our last meeting if you could just look into a few, few items, and one of them was uh, an existing construction project out here on Lowell Road and a few other things. So I know he had it in his uh, town administrator report, which is later in the evening, but I, maybe we could take this topic now. Sure. And you can update the board and the, uh, and the folks at home. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in response to the board's request at the last meeting as a result of your inquiry, yep. um, uh, myself, the fire chief, the public safety director, the public works director, and the town engineer have been in touch with yep. National Grid um, regarding the ongoing labor dispute. Uh, National Grid provided some documentation, which I included in the packet into the town administrator's report at that meeting, uh, which took place on August 9th. Uh, at the meeting, National Grid informed us that their company policy is not to discuss the labor dispute in public meetings. National Grid did indicate that many of the contractors currently performing natural gas work also perform that work during normal National Grid operations, including here in North Reading. They also indicated that many of the National Grid employees working in the field during the labor dispute had worked in the field prior to their current supervisory or office roles. Finally, National Grid indicated that their crews are currently focused on emergency repairs and high-risk leaks, although when possible, they are also addressing secondary leaks, as well as service additions or replacements or abandonments. Uh, while new construction is not a primary focus for their limited crew at this time, our understanding is that a moratorium would ensure that no such work would occur. Uh, for your information, I included uh, a memorandum from the police chief regarding the potential impact on projects here in North Reading. Um, we're fortunate the chief is here this evening. I'm going to ask him just to speak to the impact. Chief, you can do so from there. Ms. Luckowitz can pass you the microphone. Thank you. Um, they had the building inspector go and check with some of the construction projects that were ongoing in town to see what impact the moratorium would have on their construction projects. Um, I'll just summarize them. Um, he, he spoke to um, Rich Prucci from Pulte Construction here at Martin's Landing. Um, they've said that currently they have no gas lines on the property. Um, they plan on putting in this gas line soon, but haven't given mm -hmm. the go ahead or a, a time frame through National Grid. Um, he did talk about putting propane tanks in as an alternate uh, measure, um, but said certainly a, a moratorium or even a delay in National Grid um, installing the gas lines will create a significant hardship for them. Um, also spoke with construction manager at 35 Main Street, um, the storage facility that is n ongoing, ongoing construction. He said essentially project would be shut down without the ability to install gas service. Spoke to the superintendent at uh, the new construction, the new CVS construction. He said that they would also look at propane alternative. He said he may need to get another site plan approval, but um, said a moratorium will certainly create a hardship. <coughs> 
uh, for the construction project. Also spoke to um, the developer at Child Street Extension. He's waiting for electrical power to the development. He said the, mass, the main gas lines have already been installed, but he said any delay in gas service would shut the project down. Um, three other developments that are ongoing ha are going to be installing propane tanks for um, various reasons. One developer on off of Park Street, Shea Circle, um, he's currently in, in a dispute with National Grid due to the fact that he's paid for the gas service to be installed, but it hasn't been installed yet. Um, he did say that, uh, he told the building inspector any moratorium would certainly create a hardship for his uh, project. Um, so in summary, the building inspector reports that for the most part, project managers are upset with National Grid for the current delay in service. They're hoping that they will com accommodate them soon before the need to shut down each project. He also reports that the largest project in Jeopardy, Martin's Landing, may not be able to install propane tanks as a second option um, due to the fire department needing to approve any propane <coughs> tanks installed. Um, based upon the size of the buildings and the propane tanks needed, he doesn't believe that um, the fire department would approve any such um, propane tanks. Um, Pulte is going to be looking at some capacity calculations and, and forward that to the fire department. Thank you for those summaries. Thank you for looking into it. Um, Mr. Goldberto, thank you for your time looking into it. So, so you've heard the summaries. Yep. We look into it. And I know I'm doing it, speak myself personally. Uh, I'm certainly very sensitive to the situation you and your membership is in, and I do wish you the best. But I, I think we are putting our, our community and the people we've made a partnership with, especially in Lowell Road, uh, on certain projects. I think we owe it to them to stay the course and try to advocate for you the best we can um, in other ways. Yep. And, but I, I'm, I, I cannot agree to nope. a moratorium. But you know, again, we're, I'm one of five. And I know Mr. O'Leary <coughs> did recommend that we did it, but something know. else to consider if I if I may bring it up. Um, some of the other towns have been in the same position. It, it's understandable where they have projects that are already underway or there's already been a verbal committal. Um, they've read, made the recommendation that um, it become any future work that is to be requested, um, you know, come under strict scrutiny, scrutiny from the town administrator on a case by case basis, whereas. You know, the projects that have already come up go on, no issues, but anything new that may arise, you know, is just under a stricter scrutiny. Just something else to consider. Thank you. If I'm still there. Well, I, I read the correspondence uh, provided by the chief and the town administrator you know, with, with interest. And, you know, I think the latest correspondence, Mr. Gendal, I don't know what, what his role is. What's his... A position that you generally you communicated. I believe with. it's government relations for uh, government relations. I mean, for gas and electric at national. Okay, it, it, it's quite evident that um, projects such as Pulte or a storage facility or anybody else are not even on the radar screen. They're not on the grid, so to speak, uh, as far as uh, national grid at, at this particular point. This is um, in his correspondence. Uh, our work continuation plan remains in place and our work continuation workforce continues to respond to all gas emergencies, uh, ensuring safety of our employees, customers, and public. And they explain what gas emergencies can be. In addition, we have mandated compliance work that needs to be undertaken within certain time periods. Though our focus is currently emergency work and now some, man and now some mandated compliance work, we are also doing a very limited amount of non-emergency work on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, we have included work that permits a building demolition or a movement of gas service to accommodate a wheelchair ramp for a disabled veteran. Additionally, if a customer is occupying or about to occupy a primary residence and has no other source of fuel, the company will prioritize those needs and address them as soon as possible. So the focus is on emergency and mandated work and priority projects only. They can't meet our needs at this particular point uh, and at this juncture. Um, Additionally, you know, I found it interesting that uh, was it Marcy Reed, the correspondence that we got, a, an article from Marcy Reed, who's the Mass President and Executive Vice President for U.S. Policy and Social Impact, states quite clearly, National Grid is a profitable investor-owned company. I think what's happened here, and again, you think about our own labor relations and how we handle things. And again, I've been involved in labor relations for over 30 years uh, in a prior life. 
what's happening to these employees right now is unconscionable. We have an admitted national grid is a profitable investor-owned company that has shut people out, taken away their health care benefits, and have impacted families unnecessarily. They could have continued on and continued negotiations and continue to have these people working and meet the needs of our community and the projects that we've, that we've committed and partnered with, but they've chosen to shut these people out and at the same time impacted their livelihood and shut off their health care benefits. You don't mess with people's health care benefits. You don't shut people out. And this is what they've done. I think it's unconscionable, and I think we have a responsibility to let them know that we find this practice to be abhorrent and unacceptable. And you know whether we support some sort of a moratorium or come up with some sort of public statement, um, you know whether we put the moratorium in place or not, I don't believe they're going to be able to get the work done that needs to be done over at Pulte or any of these other projects that we're talking about. They admit it's not a priority, and they don't have the personnel to do it. You know, so I think it's important for, uh, and, and I appreciate you coming forward. Thank you. Um, I think it's important for us to make a statement somehow or another that, you know, we find their practice to be abhorrent and not acceptable. You know, they have a unique monopoly on, on services here as a profitable, non-investor-owned company, and they have taken away people's health insurance just because they can, you know, and who's paying for it? We are, you know, customer base here, and it's not right. So I think we need to make some sort of, and again, whether we vote for the moratorium, that's very symbolic. I don't think it's gonna have an impact one way or the other as to what they come forward with and ask and request for permits, because if it's an emergency situation, it's gonna be addressed anyway. Um, but Pulte Homes Project, not even on the radar screen. They can't service it. They can't do it. So if we can take some action and encourage them to get back to the table, and again, I read the correspondence too, where they're blaming the union for not coming to the table. You know, they say they're available 24-7, seven days a week, so there's some culpability on the union side here. Uh, but really, what gets me is taking away people's health care benefits and forcing those families to pay 100% of the premiums or lose it um, is unfair where they could continue negotiations, go for an interim agreement uh, with timelines associated with it, and that you have chosen not to do so. I think it's unfair, I think it warrants a response, and I think we um, morally have an obligation to take some sort of, uh, some sort of action. Mr. Messeri. I agree with the comments that uh, Steve has made, but I'm, I'm not in support of a monitorium. Because I think, in a way, with respect to Pulte, having that monitoring in place would only give National Grid an excuse for not supporting a very, very important project. So I think we have to find a way of getting a message to them that we're unhappy. But a monitorium, in my opinion, is not the way to go. Mr. Schultz. I have a slightly different view. While I certainly emphasize what your plight, and thank you for coming, it's twice you've taken time out of your evenings to come in here. I don't think this board should be involved in private labor disputes. What if the stop and shop workers go on strike? Are we supposed to make a stand on that? What if this other union goes on strike? We're not yeah. on strike, sir. They, they locked us out. What if We other offered to continue working. I understand that, but I, there's two sides to every story. They're saying Mr. Bonnie, we're going to go through the chair, okay? Yeah, you again? Mind. you got to go through the oh, chair. Oh, I, I apologize. Sorry. No, I, and I understand. And again, I emphasize what your plight. I mean, they're saying you won't accept the deductible or a normal health plan. Every other union plans you guys are saying to take away our health insurance. My point is, we sh as a board shouldn't be involved in a private labor dispute. Um, I don't think we should be involved in any private labor dispute. We have our own unions that we negotiate with here um, for our own town employees. I just, I, th I don't think it's our place, but I certainly, you know, emphasize what your plight and what, you, what your membership is going through. I just don't think it's our place to get involved in this. So if we have no other comments, I'd like to move on to the agenda. Well, can we make a determination as of, the, I mean, there's two, you, you don't want to take any action, apparently, uh, Mr. Schultz doesn't, but to me this is a public health issue where we have uh, potentially um, ill-trained individuals meeting in emergency situations and again not allowing other major projects to move forward, whether it be Pulte or anybody else, you know, Pulte happens to be near and dear to our heart. Um, so does the majority of the board wish to take no action or some action? Well, I certainly think it would be wonderful if there was a way we could advocate 
to move these negotiations along outside of doing a moratorium. I, I, I'm not going to support that. If there is some other kind of way we can advocate on your behalf, I'd be certainly willing to consider it. Or if it's something I can do personally outside of my Board of Selectmen responsibilities, I'd be certainly willing to do it. But I am very much in line with what Mr. Schultz had said. I'm very much uh, going to take into consideration the summary that was provided by the Director of Public Safety and the Chief. That's where I stand. Again, I'm one person. But we don't have this on the agenda tonight. We have a lot to do. But we did if promise you're not going to make a agenda. motion, Mr. No, O'Leary. We, we did promise to have it on the agenda. We, no, we, yes, we, we did. said we would. back on August 20th. We said that we were going to have the town administrator inform us, and he put it in the town administrator's report. If, if from this you want to put it on the agenda for next meeting and you want to present something at the next meeting, we can certainly make it an agenda item at the next meeting. But if you want to, or you have the option to make a motion this evening. And, you know, but we, are, we have to move on. So, I guess that you've heard from Mr. Masseri, you've heard from Mr. Schultz, you've heard from myself. I think you kind of get the sense where the majority is on this. No, I, I don't. I don't know where Mrs. Manupelli is. So it's a, well, so it's it like doesn't a two, really two. matter. To, no disrespect to Mrs. Manupelli, she can certainly have the opportunity to speak. <laughs> I will recognize her if she'd like. But we don't have the majority support to do it. And if you come up with another well, that's option, that's for a moratorium. But Mr. Masseri would, would be in favor of doing something else. I heard. Oh, well, I don't know. If you have something else, you want to make a motion. I'm going to give you a few minutes. But we have a lot on the agenda. I'm certainly not going to take up my whole evening agenda on this subject. That's just not going to happen. I cannot afford to do that. So do you... I mean, I, I don't know what your thought... I don't know what you were thinking of in terms of doing something other than a moratorium. I'm, I'm not in favor of the moratorium for the fact that because of the ripple effects, not just for the current development that's going on, but for how it affects our homeowners. I hear what you're saying, though. I'm very disappointed. We did say we would have you back and ask the representatives to be here, and I'm disappointed that they wrote a letter instead and they're not here to weigh in in person, um, other than you know telling us they have work continuation forces in place. So. I'm not sure, and I, I, a moratorium is something more open-ended, maybe something more specific that we could issue, you know, some sort of a resolve to them or um, driving the point home that, you know, we are interested in this matter because we do believe that it potentially affects the public safety. You know, I don't want us to hamstring development or future development or yeah. just a regular homeowner that needs a utility service in their in their home so um, and I don't know what we've done previously in these types of scenarios so we haven't had, I, I can't recall a public utility or a utility company shutting employees out taking away their health insurance and not being able to meet the needs of the general public uh, from a public health and public safety standpoint in all the years I've been sitting here I so this is uh, new to me if they're going to be a form of a rally or something, I'd certainly be willing to get that out locally to get more people to participate in it. There's got to be some other ways, but um, clearly the moratorium is not an answer. And, and if somebody doesn't have a, a motion to make, I'm moving on. Okay? Yeah, and, and, just, and just in relation to, you know, if Stop a Shop had a, a labor relations problem, you know, would this board be taking a position? No, it's not a public health and public safety issue. I wouldn't expect that we would. And again, privately, we'd go out there and rally with them and all the rest. To me, this is different, you know. And uh, you know, and, and again, I don't know what other communities have done who have been a bit reluctant. You started to, to um, enlighten us a little bit on that, but and I'd be open to something. Well, we could put it on the agenda for the next meeting. I'd be more than happy to do it again, but make it an agenda item. And you want to present something, or you want to present something, you certainly can. But I am not. I've already eaten up 20 minutes on this subject, and out of respect to all the other. A business that we have a lot of people here visiting tonight that have to support other agenda items so I'd like to get them home to their families as well so if you want to add it on another gender item, I'd be more than happy to consider it for our next meeting and then you can come up with some other op options but the moratorium okay. doesn't seem like it has the support that's the best I can offer tonight if you give me the option I'll be here next meeting all right, and I'll be happy to speak with you so uh, reach out well Maybe that'd be great cool. you guys could come Very up good. with something that we could consider I'm, I'm all for it thank you okay? thank you thank you no problem appreciate the time anyone else public comment we're gonna move on is there any selectman reports at this time mr. Masseri just want to uh, look forward since our last meeting 
We've had one more water sewer meeting. The focus has been on moving the FEIR forward mm -hmm. and uh, begin discussions in de trying to get some detail for the board associated with Excellent. moving forward with sewer for economic development. Perfect. We have another. We had another meeting scheduled to get canceled, and we are now meeting this Wednesday, I think around 12:30, to continue the discussions. The okay. goal is to keep things moving along. So we have an EDC meeting tomorrow evening. Is there anything I could provide other than that? Is there anything else? No, the, inf the information I requested, I did not receive, uh, and I don't know why, so. Okay. Don't know Thank you. Good. Any other reports? Mr. Real, real quick, Mr. Chair. Um, on Wednesday, 9 o'clock, I'll be meeting with some of the land use committee individuals about the bike path and the pedestrian uh, walkway that a lot of folks in town have asked about. Um, there's a lot of people in town that have put a lot of time and effort into isolating parcels, and we're going to meet again this Wednesday on that issue. All right. Next agenda item is to review, approve the payment in lieu of tax agreement with RMLD <coughs> in Next Era Minuteman project. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, just uh, by way of a quick update, we've had a couple of meetings with representatives of Reading uh, Municipal Light Department as well as Next Era, which will be doing business as Minuteman uh, here in uh, North Reading, uh, should they uh, proceed with the battery storage project. And I'm pleased to report that <coughs> uh, through those meetings, your involvement, Mr. Chairman, as well, in, the, in those discussions, we've reached an agreement for a, um, an agreement that would be a 20-year payment in lieu of tax agreement with a flat $13,500 payment in lieu of tax payment being made. Um, we, uh, there was some discussion relative to the first year and the potential for the last year, but I think we kind of settled back at the 20-year term, and that seemed to make the most sense for everybody. Um, uh, the advantage is basically this is a privately owned uh, infrastructure that will be installed and as such it's taxable uh, as personal property um, and under the scenario of it being taxed at the full um, value uh, it makes the finances for this project for Reading Light um, not feasible. And uh, that's something that became apparent over the past couple of weeks with the discussion. We provided the board some analysis, and again, this is, uh, I mean, I'll go and say that this is um, as close to cutting edge as you could probably get. Um, there aren't a lot of examples out there, at least not here in Massachusetts uh, yet. There's a lot out there on solar energy, but this is not that. This is not the generation of energy. This is the storage of energy drawn off of the uh, grid with a lowercase g. Um, so uh, we're pleased to have agreement on the business terms, but the, probably the most important thing is it's that agreement, uh, if endorsed by the board and ultimately by town meeting, uh, that will make this project possible. Um, as was reported to us by Reading Light at our meeting in June, there is a substantial state investment that is making this project uh, possible. And um, we've talked about it in, in terms of the project itself being a pilot program to evaluate the performance of these batteries. Um, so. Uh, Minuteman and slash Nextera uh, and their agent uh, have been fantastic in the discussions and we're pleased to have these business terms are arranged. Um, the way we've structured this and you, you'll see in the supplement in the packet is that we have a an agreement that the board would be asked to um, approve and authorize the chairman to sign that would be conditioned on October town meetings approval. And that's something that is important for Minuteman and RMLD to have that understanding that uh, from the uh, administrative slash um, political leadership of the town that there's support for the agreement. Um, so we were, we're hoping that we'll be able to provide them that through the discussion this evening. Um, with that, uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. Um, and we have prepared a, a motion uh, for the board to Mr. Consider. Masseri. To the fire chief. Have you reviewed this project? I was in the first or the last meeting that Mr. Gilberto uh, referenced, and we're in the process of, of reviewing that as well and making sure that the uh, project meets all the fire code. So yeah, I, I am involved. You know, I mean, from my perspective, it's an extremely large battery bank that That's correct. Stalling, yeah, it's a which extremely large. Which potentially could have some issues if something went wrong. It is a large battery bank, but they're captured in smaller cell, individual cells, which are replaceable. Uh, so they are taking precautions 
and, uh, and, and all necessary code requirements at this time. But we are in constant communication. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I'm in support of it. I'm just wondering if the fire department had reviewed the project. That's all. We have. And they will Thank be you. involved in it as they go through its permitting phase and building phase. They will be, they will be involved. That's correct. Cradle to grave. Through you, Mr. Chairman, just a, a, a comment more for just full transparency here. Uh, we did ask the assessor, who has put quite a bit of time into uh, understanding this industry and preparing information for us, which is included in your packet. We did ask her to do an evaluation of how this um, personal property might depreciate over its uh, useful life. And when we did that, we identified a, an average tax value payment, an, a, an average taxable value of between 35 and $64,000 was a range. There isn't a lot of information out there, and nor do we have the length of time to experience how this property actually depreciates. So our best option was to look at the few examples that are out there as well as solar uh, panels. Um, again, uh, I think RMLD was here two months ago saying this is not about making money, although there is an opportunity for a small savings for ratepayers here in North Reading. Uh, this is more about having the right location, the right access to the transmission lines uh, to run this pilot program and have power available here in North Reading uh, when there would otherwise potentially be a shortfall. Uh, so uh, I kind of say that more in the interest of full transparency. Um, at those values, um, this project doesn't work for RMLD or for Minuteman as far as we can see and as far as we've been informed. But this pilot payment in lieu of tax agreement, the flat predictable revenue stream that won't be subject to whatever the market does in terms of performance for this equipment uh, is what we recommend. Ms. Minupelli. And I, I think the other point, not to be redundant, but the other point that was made was for redundancy, that once they get this up and running, we do benefit as a town from having the capability to cover our, need, our service needs here if there is something that, you know, happens hazardous or catastrophic that happens too so instead of that I did see all that work that you did which is great so instead of that sort of a range it's the 13,500 per year for mm -hmm. 20 years and right now it's a tax non-taxable parcel anyway Correct. so this also gives us at least some um, financial benefit to the transaction as well that's right it, it, now and for any future um, Reading Light investment in that property would not be taxable. Right. But it's cutting edge, and it's be and it's great that we have an opportunity in this town to be part of that. And I look forward to this pro program because I do believe during the peak times this will save us money, the ratepayers' money, and that's the ultimate goal on this project. So, okay, is there anything else uh, that we need? I would like to add one other thing. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Debbie Carboni, Assessing Manager. On page three of the contract, uh, it's the one, two, three, fourth paragraph. We have kilowatts in there, and it really should be megawatts. megawatts. I'm going to be honest with you. This really doesn't pertain to the battery storage anyway. This is language that you would use for solar. So this was... A, um, a, a draft uh, contract that we had used from a solar project. So, but I wanted to let you know before you sign it that the kilowatts does need to be changed to megawatts. I think, I think this is a draft. I think that copy. So, just regard to the to the, the drafts, you had a draft that was in your packet over the weekend. Yep. There was a new draft with an opinion of town council right. placed in there this evening. It identifies the issue relative to the town meeting contingency, and I'm just verifying, but I believe we addressed that in the hard copy here, Ms. Carboni. Uh, but I'm going to confirm that. On my final, it still had the kilowatts. So it does say kilowatts. Which was my error. I didn't so catch it this afternoon. That. We, we can, and the vote is to authorize the chairman to sign in substantially similar form as well, so we can address that after the fact. Thank you, Deb. Thank, thank you, you again for all the time you put into this. I, I want to thank Tom and uh, Neil. 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 <laughs> Our time as well. So if and also the finance director for her efforts. Thank you. Uh, and I, I concur. You know, this is a uh, cutting edge. I congratulate uh, RMLD for going after the grant money and. Uh, 
having the location and of course we had some foresight a few years back to give them the location uh, and again uh, you know I think it's important for us to understand really what's the what was the value of what was being put in there what would it normally be uh, yeah. but in these types of projects obviously you're not going to glean uh, the full benefit if you're going to be on a cutting edge of uh, some technology here and this is a good opportunity and I think we should take advantage of it and uh, to Mrs. Manupelli's point you know get a little something out of it here for the next 20 years and in addition to the fact that we can get some power when we need it so it's a good thing so I'm well, it's a science well, project you. right in our own backyard that's so right. hopefully there'll be some field trips with some of the science yeah, that's programs true, yeah. um, so I'll take a motion if I could and Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the payment in lieu of tax agreement with Minuteman Energy Storage and to authorize the chairman to sign the agreement in a form substantially similar to the attached document. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mrs. Mignopelli. Any more discussion? So we have a copy, two copies here for the chairman to sign. I don't know. Oh. Yeah. You can just you slip that. Fix the page. Yeah, we'll fix the, fix the page. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you again. Congrats. Um, we can hand it to you right now after he signs it if you'd like. You just well, if you change the kilowatt. You're going to have town other with the chairman, then a man, and then ask the to form town council to town, well, That's right. Town council will need to sign so, it, yes. Yeah, you won't get it tonight. It won't be tonight. <laughs> it won't be tonight. <laughs> So, we'll just send it down to Michael now. Uh, yeah. Michael, two copies. Thank you. Okay. You just you pass it down. No, just the chair. Okay. The next, we have, um, it's really more of a uh, informational topic. It's not a hearing. It's uh, it really just more of a public awareness, slight education for us board members and for the community. Uh, and it's, I guess I can't even say the name, but... It's to dis discuss the CBD products that are here that are being sold in some of our uh, convenience stores here around town. So I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Luckowitz. Sure. Hi again, everybody. Um, so there's been a whole lot of questions going around town, so we thought um, we would just come here and answer some questions publicly and from you folks. Um, and I, I think it's really important that we start off by saying that um, it's 100% legal, these mm -hmm. products. This is something that the uh, Commonwealth voters voted for. And nothing we do or say here tonight or moving forward is going to change that. So um, this is really just more of an informative um, session. And I do want to just um, start off by, by offering, has everybody gotten the parent alert? Okay, so I do have extra copies. Is it okay if I pass them around? If people want some? Sure. Chief yeah, Chiefs can help me. <laughs> can I have a copy? I'll share that one. Thank you. So for everybody's information, this is actually the seventh parent alert that we've done since the Community Impact Team has really been active. Um, similarly, we've done some things on Jules. Um, Four Loco made a comeback a couple of months ago, maybe years ago. Uh, we did one on that. And then also another popular one was um, originally when THC candy had been found by the detectives. We wanted to make sure these, th these information pages went out to families ahead of time. And I'm really happy to say that that's kind of how this happened as well. Before this blows up in our face, we wanted to make sure that parents were aware of what the products were. And if you have the parent alert in front of you, I just would like to highlight a couple of the areas of concern on the left-hand side. And for me, understanding that my primary job is protecting kids. You know, I'm not addressing adult use at all. Um, protecting kids, the, the main area is that these products are unregulated. Um, Unfortunately, the Cannabis Control Commission and Massachusetts Department of Agriculture, um, this is, between the two, it's a very gray area. In some situ situations, CBD products are uh, regulated by the CCC. In other si situations, it's regulated by MDAR, the Department of Agricultural Resources. So um, we're kind of walking a gray area here with regard to who is in charge of monitoring these products. But ultimately, what happened was these products flooded the market and they came, came here into North Reading before the testing period or the, the testing process was in place and that's really concerning to those of us in the coalition. To give you an example, if you turn the page over, we purchased in North Reading three products. Um, I brought them for you today to, so that you can have an idea of what they look like. Uh, the first one is this package here, the party pack. Can you hold it up for a while so they sure. can zoom in on it? Sure. 
Okay. Yeah, while you're talking, you okay. go ahead and continue. The party pack, and I'm going to turn it over in just a second. You can see the products in the back involve gummy bears, um, what look like gummy worms or sour products. And they're virtually undistinguishable from regular products that are sold at any other store. Um, this product tested positive for THC. Now this is where I'll pause and let you know that these products legally can contain up to 0.3% THC before they become regulated by the CCC. The problem is 0.3% what? 0.3% milligrams, grams per piece, we don't know. We also don't know what a serving size is related to that THC percentage. Although they, rec they have a recommendation that this actually, this whole package contains four servings. So to kind of give you an idea. Um, this product was manufactured in California. No age limit on who can buy that? For this one? We're, they and the store said 18, but really it should be 21. But what's, it's, what's the law? There isn't one. There's no law. No. Any, a 12 year old person yes. could ride a bike down to one of these stores and purchase one of these products. Yes, and I did not have to pro provide my ID for this. <laughs> Did, where did you buy that? Yeah, at uh, Christopher's. Christopher's we, Market. Christopher's Market. Um, I will let you know, too, that uh, Chief has asked us to do a complete survey related to what stores in town are selling this. And this was actually backed up by a recommendation from a tobacco regulation standpoint that they recommend that we go in and look to see pre-legislation what's being available in North Reading and then once kind of the CCC and MDAR get it together, what's being sold after the fact. So we'll have a kind of a comprehensive list. It's not complete. So I don't know if there are other stores selling this product. I do think there are based on my previous surveys. Yes. It, what's the price of that? If you could hold that bag up, what's the price of something that size? Plus tax, $34.99. Um, this is a package of uh, CBD gummies. Uh, it's noted to have higher potency at 75. Se again, 75 what? Uh, this particular package was manufactured in the United Kingdom. Again, another concern of mine is that these products are coming in from overseas, not from here. Certainly not from Massachusetts, which would be required by uh, the MDAR licenses to be uh, manufactured here and also tested here. The key thing for this package here is on the back, it says in a very small writing, no THC. This again tested positive for THC when we tested it at the police department. Where did you buy that? Christopher's. All these products were purchased at Christopher's. There was a third product, and that was a gummy frog. You'll see that in the back of it. Unfortunately, um, the frog got squished during testing, <laughs> so I don't have that for you here. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what happened. The frog got squished. Um, the frog was manufactured in Colorado, and the frog tested negative for THC. So uh, the, I would also like just to add that these were three products. They sold many more. We just didn't want to spend the money on it in one spot. So. Um, I'll pause there and let you ask some questions. And um, again, I want to let everybody know that this information was well vetted based on what was available. And um, Chief can speak to who we vetted that through. But I'm, I'm really happy to say that we did our very best to provide you the most current information. Again, given that the CCC and MDAR have not really cleared all of this up. Just, Mr. O'Leary. Just as far as the logistics in the store, and again, you only went to one store, I guess, but are these products out on the counter up front, or yes. are they behind the counter products like cigarettes? Uh, they were actually right out front. Right and out specifically, front. Specifically, uh, the guy... Are they mixed in with the candy? No, okay. but they're right at the checkout. Um, and where I've noticed them before is they all seem to be with the male enhancement products. Just as a point of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, almost always when I've seen them. We've also previously purchased a CBD shot, a liquid shot, um, that I didn't bring tonight, but that was purchased in... What's the store right here? Is that lucky? Lucky Mart. Um, so I do know they are being sold other places, just I haven't been there recently. Mr. Schultz. Um, thank you uh, for th that presentation. Um, I, I know the science is still evolving on this. The, the, the product that were tested, we know tested positive for THC, the, two, the first two that you mm -hmm. showed. The testing, does it show the level of THC? No, and that's part of the problem. Okay. So well, because you don't know how to base it on. If you don't know 0.3% of of what? what? It's hard to give a level. So is it possible, and I say possible, not guaranteed, that if a minor was to eat a handful of those candies, they could have a, a THC high? I'm not a doctor. It depends on a lot of things, including you know body weight, age, um, metabolism, but I would suspect so, knowing what we know about THC. Okay. Mr. Evans, please, yes. if you could uh, go to the microphone. Uh, my question would be, just because they don't contain THC, are there other like derivatives or molecules that would be similar to THC we can't detect? 
great, great question. Um, through you, it, yes. we don't know. Because none of these products are being tested, we have no idea what's in them. We don't know if it's all sugar. We don't know if it's all chemical. We have no idea what are in these products. So anything is possible. Um, I have no idea what's in them. Nobody knows what's in them. Mr. Masseri. You held a package up a little while ago, and someone asked you what it cost, and I yes. think I missed the number. Uh, this large one was $34.99. $34. $35, yeah. $35. Yep. And the small one? Pardon? And the smaller one? Uh, this one, I believe, was $5.99. Mm -hmm. okay. $8.99, excuse 99. me. Yeah. The frog was $5. So the point of having this on the, the agenda tonight, I asked for it to be on here, is I just think we need to continue to do public awareness. No one's breaking the law. Correct. And we have to be right up front with that. We're not trying to take anyone's rights away from them. But we need parents to be aware that their children have an opportunity to go to these stores and not, ha and they meet, there's no age restriction. And parents just should become more aware. And there's going to be more stores than Lucky Martin, Christopher's Market, where these are going to be popping up because they're going to be money makers. And the controls, there's none there. So we, as a community, shouldn't have to you know, go after anyone legally here, but we should do whatever we can about awareness. Because I feel bad, God forbid, young children gets this, riding their bike, bicycle home, and has a negative effect and runs into cars or something. That's the only vision I have, and I really want us to be very aware of this. My biggest fear is toddlers. Um, you know, I, I've actually recently seen a gummy bear on the ground, and I would n not know what it was. If I'm happy to pass this around. The gummy bears and the products that are in this are indistinguishable from, from me against what a normal gummy bear would look like. And if they picked that up, you know, had a sensitivity to anything, or if, again, it had more than the 0.3% THC. Those are identical. Who, uh, they're identical, yeah. Who's right. doing the distribution on the, do we know the distributors of these products are where they come from? I mean, yeah, yeah, they have the distributor names on them. Candy no, but as home. far as, you know, the, the local outlets are buying them through wholesalers, I assume. So yeah. there's some sort of, you know, distribution uh, taking place. But um, have you had any conversation with anybody at the state level in relation to potentially regulating it or no interest in it? Or? Yeah, I'll mention that I um, recently had put an email into the Attorney General's office to get some clarification about this, also related to um, Juul advertising as a side note. Um, but when I spoke to Christopher's, the owner, or the um, gentleman who sold it to me, had a conversation with his distributor, and we've heard this from other communities, the distributors, the wholesalers, are telling the retailers that it's 100% safe and that they do not have THC in them. Now, in this case, that's not entirely true. So I don't know if the entire process is completely transparent, um, and in fact, the, the gentleman at Christopher's asked me what can I do to make sure that I'm doing the right thing because I was told that these are 100% THC free. But, well, I mean, common sense would dictate if you're paying $8 for a little pack and a $34.95, you know, $35 for the bigger package, it's a little bit more than a gummy bear. But they're not lying about that. They're saying there's CBD in it. Mm -hmm. So they, the assumption is that you're paying for the CBD, which is non-psychotropic when taken on its own, apart with, apart with a blend of THC in it. Mr. Schultz. I just looking at this package, and thank you for bringing this in. I, I see they're marketing with a marijuana leaf on the front. Mm -hmm. It says heavenly dash, dash candy.com, and there's a 720 area code, which I just looked up as Colorado. Yes. Um, and I also noticed there are supplement facts in here that would look like your normal nutritional, uh, uh, any food that you'd buy. In tiny, tiny writing, yes. Yeah, and I do see that, but I don't see one thing on here saying the ingredients in here. And, Correct. And I see... There's little gummy bears, there's octopuses, there's worms, there's all mm -hmm. kinds of things. And, and this tested positive for THC. Yes, and that's not required for them to put the ingredients on right now. And that's the concern as well. So this is like the Wild West as far as regulation. Yeah, you, you, you're taking a, it's a Russian roulette with that. You don't know what you're eating here. No. But, 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 but uh, to your point uh, just a couple of minutes ago, I, I think it's important what we're doing tonight, what you're doing, uh, just to raise public awareness and... Yep. And as always stated, this is not illegal. Correct. What's being sold is perfectly legal, but uh, you know the public awareness and mm -hmm. it's important. And, uh, and this terrific is not the first time we've being done performed this. Yeah. Here. So uh, I, I assume you know you've been involved with the schools and all the rest too. But you know, this is a good venue. And, uh, thank you. Thank you, you, thank you for coming so forward. So I just wanted, to, if I may. Um, so the previous week we've had 
several complaints and inquiries that on this product, which kind of triggered us to, you know, do our research and, and just put this awareness out there. I've touched base with the chief um, who's assigned to the Cannabis Control Commission. So at point three or above, it actually would be defined as marijuana under the law, which means the Cannabis Control Commission would govern it. Um, being under point three is, is um, you know, there's a different agency in, in our um, state that's governing it. The problem is, is like Amy said, we don't know what level we're at. When we tested them and other agencies have tested them, there's no test at this point to determine how much THC is in this. So the MDAR is actually, they, are, they have a testing, they haven't even given out any licenses yet, but there is a testing for seed cultivation, possession, distribution, and there's going to be a processing in place. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, I know the town administrator did contact Brad Jones' office to inquire as to what the legislature is, is um, whether they are speaking about this or whether it's on their agenda. Um, so again, this was an awareness only um, for parents to be aware of what is in the community. This is sold on Amazon as well. If you Google it, it's, it's there. So um, it's not just in North Riding, it's, you know, it's, it's throughout the country and on, on most internet sites. And I recently received uh, an ad for a Groupon to purchase it. Good deal. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Heather Lavardi. I'm at 280 Hebel Street, and I am the middle school co-PA president. So I guess this is what scares me most about what's coming up next. School starts in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So between this and the vaping and the juulin that goes on at the middle school, this is two, this is like a block away from the middle school. We have enough problems with the kids vaping and juuling. I don't know how we're gonna handle this at the school. I'm scared for our kids. I mean, Amy and Detective Lucci do a fabulous job. But these kids are stupid. No offense, I have two there. <laughs> naive is a better word. Okay, these kids are naive, but they're, they're gummy bears. Like, I literally showed my kids and I said, look at these. But I'm honest with my kids. My kids know everything. Amy, you can borrow my kid. Okay. Take them to the stores. Like, you can use them. But a lot of parents don't. A lot of parents are afraid to tell the kids what's going on. I, I don't know how to get the message across. And a I talk to Amy all the time about it, but I don't know what to do for our kids to have them not buy this stuff. How do we fix, like, how do well, we fix it? It starts here by, uh, by us taking the responsibility in the positions we're in to, to create awareness. And then it's up to the parents to take it from there to do the best they can. We, the town has invested in, um, in, these, in our department so we can go ahead and provide the education, to give a place where the parents can call the chief's office, they can call Amy's office, get help, get answers to questions, and if they don't have it, they have the resources to get them the answers and get them the help if we don't have it. But we have made a significant investment in this so we could reach out and provide assistance to the community in this area at this level and in, in at even the strongest drug level. So that's what we're doing. And whatever. now we need the parents to participate. Whatever we can do to help. Awareness. And, where, where and Amy are. needs help and with a more, lot more volunteers in her, yeah. com, in her uh, committees. We need more people. There's not a lot of us, but we'll help. I know you guys are great. Mr. Schultz. And I want to <laughs> echo what Mr. Chair said earlier is I've had a lot of communication with people on social media on this issue over the last week or so and Heather I know you've, you've, you've been involved in it as well okay. um, we're not trying to ban anything we're just trying to educate people if you eat these things you're eating something that you don't know what's in it and you know I'm not comparing it to K2 but K2 was once sold in this town too yeah, and K2 had uh, chief 70 or so overdoses in Connecticut last week from a bad, bad batch you just you don't know what you're, you're eating at that's what I can't emphasize enough. It's not a basic CBD product that's just CBD. That's a different animal. We're talking about something that tested positive for THC. We don't know how much is in it, and we don't know what else is in it. There's not one in, who would buy any, a food from a store with no ingredient list on it? You just, you, you don't know what you're taking, and I'm not trying to sound like the old guy that wants to ban marijuana. It has nothing to do with that. This is just a public awareness that if you eat this stuff, you don't know what you're putting in your body. And that's Let's face it, Mr. Schultz. This is not geared towards the adults. I think yeah. we all have to agree to that. They're, they're, they're gearing after the naive young adults that think this is cool and that they have an opportunity to get a high 
and they can legally buy it. They don't have to drive up to a liquor store and get denied. They can literally walk up to a convenience store and buy this. And I mean, what if it could eat the whole bag wrong. of them? We don't know. Is the point? We just don't know. Well, our There's education. We're doing our job. We're taking our responsibility serious. I then want to thank you, Amy, for coming tonight. Sure. Uh, we have a few other things on the agenda, but if there's something else you wanted to say, I'd like you to wrap it up if you could. No problem. I just want to uh, acknowledge the work. This is really a team to, uh, team effort. This was a subject that, like I said, there was no one source to go to, and so I just want to acknowledge uh, Sergeant Howe, Detective Hatch, and Detective Lucci for working with me on that because we didn't have one, a one-stop shop on, on doing our research. So I just yeah. want to acknowledge the team is effort on that. Is there going to be something in the future you think that you'd be hosting a, some kind of a workshop? On this particular issue? There's actually uh, the fall athletics meeting is coming up on the 30th of August okay. and uh, there's a guest speaker about vaping but we are going we were invited to host a resource table and this will be the handout for that. So we get the parents and if we need volunteers they can see yeah. you right? Yeah. Get the word out. Mr. Chair, one last yeah. issue if I real quick. Yeah. Yes. I just uh, Ms. Lockwood just want to yes. so the public knows if somebody was to ingest these and they had a job whether it was say drug testing mm -hmm. would this cause you to test positive on a marijuana test? We don't know. Okay. Is it, it possible it would? If it has more than the 0.3%, okay. or, well, we actually, even if it was just that, 0.3%, we don't know. Okay. They don't know what's in it. Yes. One quick thing. Um, this seems like a public health issue as well. What is the Board of Health? Well, the problem is it's not only against the law. No, but it's just a public health as far as ingesting something that's, you know, potentially hazardous. I mean, it seems like they could they can evoke some type of mandate. It's a public health emergency. I mean, it seems. I seems have to leave that one to the chief. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so we did talk to the board of health director. Um, he was certainly involved in it, but to say it's a public health emergency, it, I don't think that's been determined yet. We're we're looking at this as more prevention at this point. But certainly, we are working with the. Um, Representative Jones' office, and, and we are not going to end it here. We're going to continue to do our research and um, follow up on it, and keep the community aware when we, you know, we come across any new information. Chief, asked me to remind you of one thing. Uh, the Cannabis Control Commission did recently release their public health uh, mandated public health. Um, public awareness campaign and I just want to let you know more I'm hoping that they'll focus more and more on this to provide parents with more education in short video clips and statements uh, the first video actually they've released two videos the first video we posted on our own CIT Facebook page and social media today so if you're interested in that you can go to facebook.com and it's slash um, North Reading community and on uh, Instagram and Twitter we are at North Reading CIT so if you're interested in, in what's coming out from the CCC related to cannabis in general, uh, you can check that out. We'll be continuing to share that. Thank you again. Thank Everyone, you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, next thing on the agenda. Who's got the party? Oh, pack? sorry, one more thing. Hold on. I Mrs. Mean, oh, really? Mrs. <laughs> I mean, don't I get to weigh in on this? Um, on their website, they have a certification that none of their products contain um, the THC so we know that's false we know that the owners of these markets are buying them because they're making sales of them I get carded when I buy cough medicine and a drink and believe it or not I still get carded to buy a drink and you have to you have to show an ID if you're you know unless you're a certain age to buy tobacco products so I mean I think it should involve these business owners too although they're making a profit off the product but I don't think that I don't think I think the big issue is the misrepresentation I mean everybody's care should read labels anyway of whatever they're ingesting and I do think that it's untested territory where there may be some medicinal benefits but another thing that's clear on their website is their products aren't for the treatment or cure or of any kind of a diagnosis or disease. So there's a lot of chatter on social media about how these products are available to help people with epilepsy or to help, you know, treat children's anxiety conditions. But I don't think you can buy those over the counter at Christopher's or Lucky Mart. So nor in a party pack. Or a party <laughs> pack. But I would I would be doing the same thing. And I'm not saying it has any kind of you can get a high from it, but what is clear is that they're misrepresenting this, that it doesn't have any THC in it, and we know from the testing that it does. So. All right. You're good. I apologize. It's all right. 
All right, thank you again, thank you. Amy. Um, <laughs> can we go to the Comcast agreement real quick, if you mind? So we, because we're kind of running a little bit behind, and you get paid by the hour, right? No. <laughs> Damn. Yikes. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Through you, I know Mr. Strobe is here. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, so this is really a, a, an administrative action. Um, those who have been following along know that we voted to approve and sign a license agreement with Comcast back in, I believe, February uh, of this year. Uh, but after that approval, we identified that the accompanying side letter, which governed the transition from the existing institutional network to the institutional network that we'll be constructing over the next 18 months, um, th there was an incorrect deadline with that. And it took us some time going back and forth with Comcast to get that rectified, but we ultimately did get it rectified. But in doing so, some of the deadlines associated with the previously executed license passed. So we're asking the board to re-approve and sign this license under the same business terms. And Mr. Strobe, I believe you've had the opportunity to review the document and the side letter. You know, just to, um, to stipulate again, it will ultimately increase the percentage of payment to 5% uh, for the, uh, on the gross revenues. There's a $150,000 capital payment over 10 years and $75,000 being paid, not as a pass-through to the subscribers here in town, but as a separate amount by Comcast to the town that will go towards the construction of the new institutional network. Those are the core business terms. Um, we have the agreement here with a motion. It does rescind the previous vote because we're going to replace it with a new approval. And this license would be effective September 1st, 2018 for a 10-year term. And my understanding is that a potential agreement with Verizon may not be far behind. Correct. So thank you for your Verizon reference. Verizon is being held up because they need this sign before this. Mr. Chairman, I move to rescind the board's vote of February 12, 2018 <coughs> and approve and sign the amended Comcast license agreement for the period September 1, 2018 through August 31, 2028 and to authorize the chairman to sign the INET decommission agreement. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Minupelli. Any more discussion? Thank you again for all your work on this. Uh, if there's no other discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. All right, so, Mr. Chairman, there's um, three copies for all members of the board to sign, and then, I believe, three additional for the chair only. Correct. Okay. All right. All right. The floor is yours, Ms. Rourke. Sorry for the delay. Okay. What page is this on? Yeah. We, this actually came in separate, right? Is this separate in our? So the presentation is separate, but yeah. the actual documents were in the packet. Oh, I see. Oh. All right. Yeah. yeah. And Mr. Chairman, may I just do a brief introduction? Please. Do. Thank you. So this is a, a, a new exercise, new this fiscal year. Um, where we're taking the opportunity to apprise the board uh, and the community of where things ended from an extender expenditure standpoint in fiscal year 2018. So normally, when we do our review of the budget, it takes place in the context of the Saturday budget hearing in the spring, as well as multiple Monday evening budget hearings that take place in the springtime. Um, we're usually at that point more focused on what's upcoming in the next year versus what the performance was in the departments for previous years or for the previous year. So this instance tonight, we've taken that opportunity. The board's been provided a MUNIS printout that shows um, per department by salary and expense where things ended from an expenditure standpoint. Uh, and we have a presentation here that the finance director has put together. Uh, and there's a couple of areas of note that we'll talk about here that we'll just uh, update the board with regard to uh, where things stand. With that, I will turn it over to the finance director. Good evening. Um, as the town administrator stated, this is a new exercise um, for us to be presenting publicly. This is an exercise that happens um, internally for me um, every fiscal year end. Um, so I just want to note too that these are not final numbers um, as of yet. They are pretty much close, but there could be slight um, you know, changes here or there once we close the, the books and submit our uh, balance sheet to the Department of Revenue, which will take place uh, the second week of September. So these numbers are, are good numbers, um, just 
having a caveat that there could be, you know, say $500 um, that someone forgot to encumber or something for a prior year bill, they still have the opportunity to, to do that until I um, close the books and submit uh, the balance sheet to the Department of Revenue. On this slide, this is just a, a snapshot um, and a summary of the departments um, that you received uh, with the Munis report of the year-to-date budget report. This um, just basically summarizes each department um, and it collapses both salaries and expenses together. Um, the breakdown would be referenced on the year-to-date budget report. I don't know if you want me to go through them or highlight some of them um, or if there's particular questions on a department at this point. We are going to review the three big departments, DPW, police, and fire on their um, salary and expenditure results. I, I will just note that um, some that stick out would be the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee um, had very few reserve fund transfers and that's the reason for having um, a remaining balance of 105. Um, accounting, having a balance of 77, that's a combination of salaries and expenses. I, had, I have a vacancy um, in the accounting department. Um, IT also had a vacancy of the GIS coordinator, which now has been filled and moved under um, the Department of Public Works. Um, the police department we will review, as well as fire um, and DPW. Uh, the other large area is youth services, and that's due to a vacancy um, from, I believe, about mid-October or October to April. And then debt service, um, this has to do with budgeting for uh, certain items that were approved that we did not go long term on and we just um, did short term um, bans for those items. All of these turn backs um, flow into free cash, so when free cash gets certified, these items play uh, a role in that. Any questions before I move on? Yes. Did you total that all up? Um, I do have a total, but you'll notice, Bob, that the salary pool is to be determined. So yeah, yeah, I, I don't want to give I don't want to give a total okay. at this all point. Right. Yeah, thanks. I'll also just note that we have fifty dollars projected there, but I believe we owe that to the town moderator as the second installment of his salary. <laughs> so we may end up expending that before things get closed out. That's the total <laughs> moderator budget. There's no second installment. That's the annual budget for the moderator. So. I guess I'm, I'm caught for not compensating the moderator then. <laughs> okay, moving on to um, DPW. So DPW um, had some vacancies in FY18, including um, a partial vacancy for the DPW director filled by um, Mark Clark on a temporary basis. So the DPW did not need a salary pool transfer um, where other departments, you'll see later in the presentation, did need a transfer for contract settlements. DPW's contract was settled, I believe, in late December, um, and they were able to absorb um, all the increases that were associated with the contract. They also are turning back, um, they have expenditure savings of approximately 107,000, and of that 107, um, they are able to use 34 of it for some small uh, capital items that were not initially funded. Um, the town administrator and myself met with the new DPW director to review requests that had been made for these small capital items, and we, um, you know, were presented with a case that these were necessities. Um, and we are able to fund them. Any questions on that? The fire department. Um, so the fire department, uh, you'll see in more detail um, at the end of my presentation, um, all the departments that received a salary pool transfer, but this is a, a snapshot of what the fire department received for a salary pool transfer. Um, the salary line item received a transfer of 63000 and that was due to uh, the contract settlement. The overtime budget line item received a transfer of 106000 
24 of that was due to FY17 retro for the contract settlement, and 45.7 was due to the actual cost of living contract settlement um, to the overtime budget. So of that 106, um, you, you can see that a majority of that was due to contract settlements. And then other incentives, this is um, education incentive and other um, specialties that received a salary pool transfer of approximately $8,400. And again, that was due to the cost of living. The fire department expenditure line items had a surplus of uh, $38,000 uh, that they are turning back for FY18. The fire department um, overtime results, this um, may look familiar to you. This uh, spreadsheet was presented on February 12th when myself and um, Chief Stats came in front of you to let you guys know that the fire department was having an overtime um, overrun and we came forward with revised budgeted hours as well as um, information regarding the contract settlement and what the revised budget hours um, translated to dollars. So that is represented on this spreadsheet. Um, I know it's rather small, it is in the packet, um, but the bottom line is that at June 30th, 2018, the fire department ended the year spending $971,000 for overtime. Um, what their original FY18 budget amount was, was $857,000. That was prior to the contract settlement. So $857,000 was the FY18 original budget. Nine oh two represents what the um, FY18 modified revised budget after contract settlement. And when we came in front of you on February 12th, we um, had projected a million sixty-three as what the uh, revised budgeted hours um, times dollars would would represent. And then they ended the fiscal year at nine seventy-one. So you can see that. Um, I'll let the fire chief speak to this, but you can see that we um, did not, you know, use all of the revised budgeted hours or revised budgeted dollars that we anticipated needing. And the chief can speak to what uh, was put in place um, to curb some of the um, spending. Sure. Yes. Thank you very much. So we came before you uh, at that time uh, anticipating an overage of about $160,000 due to the changes in the fire department and change of personnel, my position, captains, and open positions, the domino effect that had on our budget, as well as a contract settlement. Um, as a finance director pointed out, we, uh, we, didn't, we came in about $90,000 under that, so that was good. Uh, we also put in place uh, several uh, management uh, changes that I think helped helped us achieve this goal, and uh, and I'm happy to see that that it, it appears to have worked. So, yeah, because when we went to town meeting, we were trending in a very negative way, I and mean, we were all very concerned. So, correct. I think this is a fantastic sh shift from what we pre previously was expecting. So maybe if you could just highlight some of those changes that you had contributed, I think it would be helpful for us to understand how you were able to accomplish this because this is pretty monumental. <coughs> sure. So, so two of the changes revolved around um, changes in our box alarm and station coverage policies. Um, I, I believe that that, uh, that assisted us in, in achieving these goals. If you'd like me to get into specifics, I can. Uh, it's uh, up to the town administrator. What you yeah, I mean, I think it's... You know, a description of the policies and maybe where the, where the change was. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to go too far into the detail, but that's most folks, I don't think, know even know what the verbiage means, right. let alone <laughs> what the implementation is. So just a, a brief description. Sure. So our, so our ability to recall personnel during uh, times of incidents where we need more resources on the road, those are referred to as box alarms. So we transmit a box alarm to get more uh, manpower and resources out quickly to real or perceived incidents. Uh, we changed uh, one of our policies regarding that in that limiting the amount of time personnel have to come back to the station for pay 
uh, when we've determined that that emergency no longer exists. So that's one of the major changes. Another involved the, our station coverage policy where we limited the amount of time personnel can come back. Uh, when they're coming on to shift, <coughs> by and large, I think each of these, these are, are smaller items, but in the, in the bigger picture, I think they accomplished or helped us accomplish this goal. That's great. Uh, you know, we want to thank you and your membership for executing these changes because they were certainly helpful in us to try to figure out how we were going to right this ship. We we're certainly trending in a negative way in the last five years. As I pointed out at town meeting, we ran over by $100,000 in the last three out of the last five years. And so it's this kind of efficiencies and, and change and how we can maybe look at things a little more efficiently that will certainly help us be more sustainable. So thank you, and I want to thank your, your department for working with you to execute this. Thank you very much. <coughs> Moving on to um, the FY18 uh, fiscal year end results for the police department. The police department did not receive a salary pool transfer. Um, there were no unsettled contracts within the police department. Um, so, it, it, you know, the FY18 budget uh, was, was what the budget is. Um, the police department had a, a salary surplus of $252,000. Um, this surplus was due to a vacant position um, and a transfer as well as overtime savings. And we'll see that on a next slide about the overtime. Um, the police also turned back $52,000 in their expenditure budget. Again, this is small, but this is um, not uh, something that you have not seen. This is the FY18 Police Department overtime budget request. So I'll just point out that right up here in this corner is what the budget amount was for overtime, and it's 647000 um, This just is showing you what the FY18 original budget was for overtime for the police department and it breaks it down um, and this is in in your budget book um, and I can also send it out as a spreadsheet if if need be um, so the budget request was six hundred and forty seven thousand dollars and the next slide shows um, that the total overtime costs for the police department were Call it four hundred and ninety-two thousand dollars, so six forty-seven, four ninety-two, um, and this breaks it down to the hours that were used in each category. So you can compare um, the budget request to this uh, summary page, and the police chief is here to answer um, any questions in regards to that. Chief, I, this is a significant. Uh surplus so maybe we could just I understand I think this the salary a little bit more maybe could you just maybe overview a little bit on the overtime and how okay. you were able to result such if, a surplus yeah sure if I could just back up to the expenses um, sure. for us to address the fifty two thousand dollars so when we when we budget um, one of the most significant I guess savings came on tuition reimbursement um, we ask offices at the beginning of the year when we're preparing for our budget and uh, who's going to be attending college, how many classes they're going to be attending, and the approximate cost of that. So during the budget process, we received information from all our offices that um, the cost would be estimated around 55000 We ended up spending only 32000 which left us a balance of 21000 in that particular account. Um, Fast forward to FY19, we took that into account when budgeting for next year. So if you look at our FY19 budget as opposed to requ request, as opposed to our what we spent, we've actually reduced our FY19 budget by 35,000 based upon the overages here. Some of the other significant um, savings were cruiser repairs. We budgeted 24,000, only spent 19,000. Some training, not, not so much overtime training, but the, cl the cost of the classes to go to trainings. Um, there was a savings of $3,100. And then supplies, which are anything from paper to um, equipment for the offices, we, we had a savings of over 5500 And then vehicle supplies, which is tires, oils, and things of that nature, um, we trended in a, in, a, um, in a positive on that one of $3,000. Again, 
all these items we accounted for in our FY19 budget, so we took into account, which happens quite often. We're, we're, we kind of fluctuate there. As far as the, the overtime and salaries go, we had a couple of um, unexpected um, personnel changes throughout the year. Um, one of them was originally we, we had budgeted for our school resource officer. Uh, we added a detective to our detective bureau, so there was 10 weeks of unfilled um, salary pool until we hired an officer in November, of, um, I'm sorry, in September of 2017. So um, Officer Lucci, who was transferred to a school resource officer, was making um, 1,122 per week for a total of 10 weeks, which um, kind of for a savings of about $11,000. Um, two unanticipated um, vacancies within the department. Jim McCormick retired this past February. His original salary item was $76,000. Um, on his date of retirement, he had only, um, we had only spent 38,000 out of his line item for his particular salary, which left a total of 37,000 remaining. His replacement, um, we only ended up costing us $22,000 for the remainder of the fiscal year. So there was a savings of about 15,500 in his salary. Um, we had an officer who resigned his position last November. Again, it's very similar. He, his position was, um, his line item was 66,000. On um, the date of his resignation, he had, um, we had used about 25,000 of his line item. Um, so uh, all total, his replacement um, in his combination of his salary, we had about $20,000 unspent in his salary line item. So between the two, there's about $47,000 in unspent salaries there. Um, as far as the overtime goes, it was $108,000 of um, accrued vacation, sick time, sick buyback, and time owed that we originally had budgeted for. Um, uh, there's a ton of different factors that go into that, and I'll, I'll explain a few of them. Um, so all contractual time off is calculated to hours and then calculated at 6.5 hours for every 10 hours. The reason for that is we have our day shifts are usually filled at eight hours um, because there's no overlap shift. Our afternoon and evening hours are filled at five hours uh, because there's an overlap shift that comes in at nine o'clock, which essentially doubles the, the um, patrol force from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. So that reduces our overtime. We're only filling at five hours there. So we average our overtime at 6.5 hours. We combine the two of them. We have, out of our six day shift position, patrol positions, seven of them are officers with two, or two years or less experience, which means they have two years or less accrued time, vacation time, and whatnot. When they originally, when the budget was being processed, we don't know who's going to be working those day shifts or, or the night shifts. So um, we just budget based upon the average overtime rate um, those officers are making significant more, less money than the more experienced officers um, per hour, and they're also making less on overtime um, for each one of their shifts. So the vacation time, you know, we, we base that on 6.5 hours, um, and when you see, a, you know, a significant savings there, it's nothing, it's not nothing we did to change the way we staff. Um, it's just the people who are working the ship by contract and also the amount of accrued time that they have that they spend. In addition to that, each office is able to carry over 40 hours into the next fiscal year. Um, so we had, when we're preparing our budget in November, um, we ask all the officers to, you know, let us know if they're going to be carrying over their vacation time. So originally we had offices committing to 560 hours of vacation carryover, um, but in reality um, only 360 were actually carried over. So there was a um, 200 of unspent hours, which we calculated at the 6.5 hour rate. So essentially we had 7,500 left over in that category. Um, as far as time owed goes, um, again, officers are able to carry over 40 hours again. We had um, essentially, we had 439 hours carried over from fiscal year 18 to fiscal year 19, which essentially, um, based upon what we budgeted and what we actually spent, was a $16,000 difference. 
Um, our sick buyback category, uh, we saw a savings of $14,500. However, the way the sick buyback is actually accrued, it's accrued in January for whatever reason, long before my time. Um, so that sick buyback, we don't know if they're going to use it in the first six months. They could be using it, and so we could be in a deficit for FY19. It's unfortunate. It's the only accrued, um, accrued benefit that goes calendar year as opposed to fiscal year. So for us, it's more of an average. We, we go by what's averaged the year before, and that's how we budget going forward. So um, again, we had over $14,000 there of savings. Um, one of the other things, and I, it's very difficult to figure this out, but we have a, uh, reserve officers who make $23 an hour as opposed to our average overtime rate, which is $57 an hour. Um, one of our reserve officers works about 8 to 10 hours a week. So, you know, you're talking about a $30 difference for those 10 hours. He works that on a, on a weekly basis, so there is a significant um, savings there. Um, and he only gets those shifts if other officers don't take them. So, um, when we account for him working, it's straight time, it's the $23 an hour. But we calculate his hours at the overtime rate because we don't know what, what he's going to work or what he's not going to work. Um, there was $17,043 in unused sick time funds, and that's just a result of officers taking less sick time. Um, I budgeted uh, for our SWAT and MLEC officer, his training and call outs. It was $7,300 remaining in that balance. And that's just due to less call-outs, and um, there was some le reduction in training that, um, you know, that's just the nature of, of, of the position. We also had $8,500 in court time that was unused, and that's just less officers being subpoenaed to Superior Court. Um, so that's a summary of, I guess, unexpected savings, because they certainly weren't anything that I put in place to create this. It's just happened. Thank you. Okay. Right. So, I'm sorry? Please continue. Okay. Um, so the next uh, three or four slides is just a, a summary of all the salary pool transfers um, and it just goes through the departments that received salary pool transfers. This past year we um, had the non-union um, agreement settled, so there was significant um, retro and cost of livings associated with with that. Um, and you know, the departments that have employees that were in the non-union did receive those, um, or it could be you know an individual employment contract that was settled. Um, but on this screen, you see the selectmen, town administrator, human resources, finance um, department, assessing, treasury. Um, and so selectmen and TA, um, as well as HR, finance, all of these receive non-union. Um, the town administrator um, was a combination of department head and uh, the non-union agreement settlement and the finance department as well. Um, my contract was renewed in um, FY18 and my the assistant finance director is also paid out of this and that was considered non-union um, and then assessing in treasury as well as is non-union. Um, continuing on the collectors uh, town clerk and conservation and CPC, um, same idea, non-union, as well as um, the conservation. There was non a non-budgeted item for um, meeting um, meetings that wasn't budgeted within um, the CONCOM um, FY18 original budget. Um, as we reviewed, the fire department is listed here, and it lists all the transfers that they received from the salary pool and the descriptions as to why they received um, those dollar amounts. Um, same with the building department um, that would have non-union employees in it um, as well. And Board of Health, Elder Services, Veterans, and Library, um, same idea, non-union. Um, and any sick buybacks 
and vacation buybacks as well as an item that gets transferred in, which is a non-budgeted item annually. So if you were to look at the FY18 or 19 operating budget, we don't budget in the department's budgets for um, sick or vacation buyback. That's something that is budgeted for in the salary pool. Any questions on that? So this is something new that typically you do not receive, but it had been question. There had been various questions over the past fiscal year of, you know, exactly how the salary pool works and whatnot. So this is a breakdown, you know, with descriptions by department that received a salary pool transfer. The departments that are not here on this um, spreadsheet did not receive them. Any questions? Please. Thank you for this. This is act great work. I mean, I'm sure it took you a, a lot of time to pull it together, but this it was is a, a department-wide effort. I mean, we do this yeah. annually um, internally for mm -hmm. the fiscal year end for ourselves for reporting purposes. So it was just you know putting it all together in a, um, a packet so that it made sense and flowed yeah. properly. So with the, with the explanations of everything, I think this is great. Thank you again. Thank you, Chiefs, for staying this evening. Deputy Director as well. If there's no other questions, we'll cut them loose and let them get some sleep because they're going to be back here in a short period of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Next item is to review the warrant articles for October Town Meeting. And there should be a separate. Is a separate file, file that is in there. That is correct. Uh, I apologize. I don't immediately have access to bring it up online unless there's a share file link on there. Um, I, can, I can look one moment, please. Sure. Uh, I can read them out if you want. I, I was going to go through them unless you tell me not to. No, please go through. <laughs> I was just trying to help you. Yeah. Um, so, number one, here and act on reports of town officers and committees. That's a routine article. Number two, prior year bills, a routine article. Number three, appropriate money for the Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund, routine article. Article four, appropriate money to the Stabilization Fund, a routine article. Number five, appropriate money to the Other Post-Employment Benefits Fund, that has become a routine article. Number six, a new article, which we hope will continue to be a routine article, the appropriation of money to the Participating Funding Agreement Fund. So that is a fund that was established at the June Town meeting and is a place to which we intend to transfer the town's portions of remaining funds from the performance of the PFA, the final numbers for which we'll have available sometime in late September. Articles 7 and 8 are to amend both the operating and capital budgets for fiscal year 2019. As I mentioned previously, we should expect to make an adjustment to the Water Department budget as a result of the approved rate structure in June and the agreement with Andover as well as capital expenditures um, for uh, some areas where we need to do some corrective uh, language changes because of the way they were worded in the June town meeting. Uh, there are no new projects under that article. It's just correcting the approvals to reflect what the intention was. Article 9 is the uh, annual funding of town building repairs. And I expect that the bulk of the recommended appropriation will be for HVAC repair improvements here in the uh, town hall most notably a uh, unit for this room. <laughs> Heating and cooling in this room, which we believe will be a lot more efficient and effective um, than what we're currently using, which is two separate units, one of which is off the main um, boiler in the building. The intention is to address both efficiency and effectiveness of that equipment. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, it's effective. It's freezing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's rather comfortable, don't you? Uh, you have two settings, equator and arctic. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's good. Put your sweater on. Do you have the slippers on? I'm not saying a word. <laughs> <laughs> Article 10 would appropriate funding for engineering, design, construction, and or betterment for the Swan Pond Road project. So again, those who were following along from the June uh, town meeting, we appropriated funding for some engineering work. We've been going through the administrative process of getting a um, release form to enter the property developed by town council. I think we're close on a version of that. Uh, which will get signed by the uh, abutters so that we can enter the property and conduct the assessment that was committed to. Um, our hope is that we'll have meaningful information available to us for the October town meeting, which is why the article is here. 
Um, it's not a guarantee, and it's not a guarantee what the next step will be, whether it will be additional design that's required, additional engineering, or perhaps we'll be at a point where we're able to recommend construction. Um, of course, uh, I, do, uh, I think we heard from the Capital Improvement Planning Committee that if we are at that stage, um, they, uh, I think, hope to be heard from in terms of a recommendation. We just don't know where we'll be at that point, but we're trying to leave all of our options open by having this as a Warren article on here. <coughs> and I want to thank the Department for submitting that article. Uh, Mr. Barr in particular for drafting it. Um, number 11, rescind authorization to borrow. We see this most likely being related to the uh, previously authorized water enterprise projects for the MWRA interconnection, but it could be other authorizations as well. Article 12, appropriating funding for water system improvements. That's um, an article that you're going to continue to see submitted as we go along through the water project, and it's intended to just provide a place for us to appropriate funds related to the Improvements to the connection with Andover, right? at this time we're not projecting that we need any additional construction funding, so we don't expect to be asking for funding, and that we would therefore be recommending to pass over the article. But much as was the case as we were going through the MWRA project, we're going to intermittently hold these articles there so that we're able to react quickly and maintain the timelines that we've set forth on this project. Again, I can't stress enough, we're not, we're not projecting any appropriation funding for additional construction at this time on the water project. Um, this, this next article would authorize the uh, obtaining of property for the water system improvements uh, at or near the Andover town line. This is for the so-called uh, chlorination or small water treatment facility. Um, this is one where we're evaluating the, the, the cost at this point in time, but there may be a need for funding for property acquisition. Uh, we had some rough estimates. I want to say there were $3 million we were looking at when we were estimated the total project cost for the Andover side of it. But where the land acquisition fits in that, I think, is unknown at this point, or at least not, not yet finalized. So uh, we felt it's important to have that there. It's a similar exercise to what we went through with the water um, treatment, uh, excuse me, the water pumping location on Mill Street, um, but on the opposite end of town, and to serve a purpose not necessarily to pump, but more to rechlorinate uh, the water, which we discussed as far back as last September. Uh, so this would be an article to authorize that, and we're looking at potential sites for that to take place at. Um, the Article 14 would appropriate funding for continued wastewater planning, engineering, and design. Uh, we don't feel we're in a position we'd be looking for additional funding for construction at this point, but if we want to continue to advance past the permitting process, this funding would be required. We don't have a cost estimate, I believe, yet, but that's something we should have before um, we uh, have the warrant article hearing. And again, as I think Mr. Masseri mentioned, we have a pretty significant uh, update meeting on Wednesday afternoon. <coughs> Article 15 would appropriate money for the ongoing special counsel legal expenses associated with the secondary school building litigation. Article 16 would authorize the pilot payment in lieu of tax agreement with Minuteman, which was approved earlier this evening, condition to this article. Article 17 would authorize the sale of 9 Mill Street, more specifically, uh, we expect it to be a recommendation for the house lot portion, uh, the portion of that house lot with the home on it, as well as its other amenities, with the town keeping the uh, so-called upland portion for potential future utility use if needed. Again, we have a significant meeting on that scheduled for Wednesday where we hope to work out those details largely. Article 18 um, came in today. It's the funding for an open space and recreation plan consultant, and this would allow for an update of the town's existing uh, open space and recreation plan, which is approximately, I believe, six years old in its approval and due for an update. It was submitted by the uh, town planner, but it's obviously something that's done in conjunction with Parks and Recreation, as I understand it. Um, article 19 uh, was uh, passed over at the June town meeting, but they were encouraged to submit the article for um, this October town meeting. And in fact, I don't think we even required them to submit it. I think we just carried the language over because of the commitment that we made in um, June. We hope that we'll be in a better position to fund this article uh, once we know more about available dollar, funds. Dollar. I believe it was $55,000. Yeah, 50, 50 or 55. Um, I have 50 in my head. But. Yeah, I have 52, so I have 50, yeah. 50,000 as well, I should say. So um, you know, we're keeping that kind of as a, something we're aware of going into the October town meeting for funding pur purposes. Uh, Article 20, this is something that we put on there, um, for lack of a better term, um, as a, a placeholder to follow up on the discussion that took place leading into June town meeting. It would be an article that, in theory, the board would potentially submit 
relative to snow removal on streets and sidewalks. It, is, uh, it has a companion article um, in Article 22, which is a citizen's petition submitted uh, largely by the membership of the Chamber of Commerce that would uh, delete or repeal the existing snow removal bylaw for streets and sidewalks. Again, another area where we have a significant meeting scheduled for tomorrow, I believe, to which Mr. Prisco, Mr. Schultz, the DPW director, uh, Mark, you might be off the hook on this one, I think. Imagine that. <laughs> um, the police chief will be present. I think Mr. Deming will be there as well. So it'll be a large scale meeting to try to talk about where else are there alternatives to address the concerns as we understand them. Can I ask a question from our 22 then? I know we're not there yet, but sure. it's related. So does that mean even if we go with an amended article that we, the board wants to support, they may pass 22. What well, happens? That's why I would suggest, suggest, first of all, that we just reverse 20 and 21. And so have whatever the board is going to sponsor come up first with the citizen's petition afterwards. And I think if the first one passes, the second one I think they be want upset. to work with and if, the board. And again, yeah. if it doesn't pass, then the following one probably would. So, so just put them next to each other rather than... So swap what 22 so, and 21? So make, 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 make 20, 21, make 21, 20. So and then you're going to have the medical general bylaws sponsored by the board okay. right before the citizen's petition. Which makes way more sense to me is kind of where I was going. Sure. And then just to make sure I'm clear, and then Mr. Schultz, I'll recognize you. Um, if theirs prevails, that means we have no bylaw? That's my understanding of their intention. Yeah, and in my when I met with the business community, I think they wanted, they just wanted the, 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 theirs on there as a placeholder to make sure they got it heard this time because it was passed over last time. I think they want to work with our board to come up with a joint effort on this too. So I don't think there's, gonna, I don't okay. envision there being two different. So we'll, put, we'll update the board at the next board meeting. Yeah. Something significant comes out between now and then. We can email it out as information. Okay. But I'd like that suggestion. So. So we'll reverse the order of 20 and 21. All right. Just put the two like <coughs> similarly subject matters next to each other. Uh, so article, current article 21, which will now be article 20, is the street acceptance for the middle and high school driveway. Uh, this uh, would allow us to formally create as a street the property that, would, that the board voted to accept oh. on the so-called Gill property. It's where the existing traffic control structures are. Um, when we accepted the street and named it the middle slash high school driveway in 2015, uh, that portion was not under our control. We therefore couldn't accept it as a street. So now this would amend that approval. Is that actually the name of the street? It, the name is middle slash high school driveway. <laughs> uh, and it's only for the stretch that basically runs um, on the, at the end zone of the football field. What's the address of the school? Is it like one middle high school driveway? It's technically 189 Park Street. That's the address <laughs> of the parcel, um, but who's counting? <laughs> so uh, that, uh, I think, takes us to Article 23, which is a citizen's petition to change the name of Bon Pell Drive to Brian's Way. And uh, as we uh, understand it, this is a petition uh, led by a family of a deceased um, uh, young boy. Uh, who wished to name the property, uh, name the street uh, in his memory uh, because of uh, time he spent there with uh, family or extended family. Um, he was refer they were referred to this process by a member of the Planning Commission when they initially went to the Planning Commission. Uh, we've been advised by town council that an approval by town meeting would be advisory to the selectmen, but that ultimately any decision to actually change the name would need to be made by the board. Um, it's different from a subdivision where the, the Planning Commission is involved in the approval of the street naming. They have very extensive regulations, but they don't apply to an existing accepted way, which Bonpel uh, Drive is. So is there another option we can offer them without making the name change? So, I mean, I, I, you and I spoke obviously briefly about this. I've seen, you know, instances where there's been some other monumentation that has taken place, and it can run the gamut from, you, you see, in in some communities, they have the official name of the street, and there might be a secondary honorary name on a sign. Um, a naming of a square, uh, which interestingly, I think, may require approval at town meeting if we were to actually name a square. But as I understand it, this is a cul-de-sac. 
that we're talking about. Um, so there may be some option that's there, um, but my, our understanding is that there are only a handful of homes on this property, many uh, on this street, excuse me. Many of them are family members of the this, uh, deceased individual. And again, I'm relating the property secondhand, so I, the, the story secondhand, I, I don't want to represent that I know all the details, but that's how it's been explained sure. to me. There may be one property owner who is not a family member, but our understanding is that person does not object to the proposed change. I don't, I don't object to it. I just look at this from a uh, sort of labor perspective and what's the, you know, it may sound simple, but it seems to me that there has to be a significant amount of administrative change here in town hall if this this happens, right? And not just town hall, but you know any sort of commu mail communication happening between the town hall and the residents, between the residents and any number of people that ha have an interest or don't have an interest in the property. So I mean, there is certainly an impact that it will have impact everybody, not just us. Uh, so is there a potentially a cost associated to the taxpayer yeah, with yeah. this change? I think that there'll certainly be at least a cost in manpower, um, and there may be a, an actual financial cost depending upon implementation I think that's something we need to look further at I think it'd be important for us to know that by the time we have a public carry on this and would we want to engage a conversation with the uh, residents about yeah. some alternatives potential alternatives but we should be honest with them too, to let them know that if there is a financial impact we should just be honest with them and let them know mm -hmm. so they're not caught off guard or anything if it's discussed at town meeting so the, the expectation would be that if there is a cost it would be borne by the petitioner I'm just assuming I mean I don't know how you've done this in the past yeah I, I haven't interacted with it in terms of uh, a street with any actual residents yeah, on it I don't recall name changes I don't recall a name change taking place before no okay yeah, that, was that was but that was done more through the Planning Commission no, before 911 I right. so it was done uh, in concert with Dogwood being developed as a subdivision. As a subdivision. Well, I think there'd be some 911 adjustments to be made. I think there's, there's a lot of costs yeah. that could be associated yeah. with I mean, this. Are, there, there are no I just want to make sure that they're, that they're aware of it and yeah. that we make them aware of it. That's uh, all. There's no doubt there's in, there are impacts. I'm, I'm and I'd be happy to, to meet with them if you want uh, with you. Yeah, change your addresses. Okay. Is there any other warrant articles we're missing? So the finance, the finance director and I looked at this list to try to come up with it. You know, we've tried to throw, kind of, every, not, I don't want to say throw, we've tried to put everything on the list we foresaw it coming. You, the board won't be asked to sign the warrant until the second meeting in September, September right. because of the later town meeting to comply with the charter provisions. So we do have some time in terms of potential articles. The deadline has passed for um, a department to submit and expect it to be included on the warrant, and certainly for a citizen's petition. What about water meters? Do we need to have anything here for water meter, that water meter program? Should we um, have anything there for it? Uh, with regard to any potential costs associated with it, I mean, we, we have a significant contingency available in the appropriations. I want to say it's about $200,000 associated. And then? Uh, at least 150. So I, we're and not. And you had mentioned something earlier about us not having enough money for our street program for FY19? So, uh, Mr. Bauer may not have been in the room, but um, I, I mentioned to them our conversation relative to the existing payment management plan and our funding strategy and your initial analysis that while the $800,000 investment was um, a great investment, that it does not address the pavement condition in, a, in a, the timely fashion I think that, you w that we would hope it would. Um, so, that's something we've talked about in the context of fiscal year 2020. Uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to, to do something with that. Um, outside of that capital planning process, particularly given how quickly the meeting is coming up on us, but it's mm -hmm. something that the director and I have talked about as okay. a potential significant change in what we've been asking for funding. Um, I, I, I mean, I, and I think it starts with the discussions we've had at the capital committee where they very clearly have indicated it, it, it's very apparent our overall pavement rating has decreased right. since the last evaluation was done, I and mean, that's not a good sign for us. And well, I, I was only bringing it up standpoint if we have an opportunity where we're already in a particular area and to extend it in that area if we haven't you know we can gain some efficiency and some cost reduction rather than holding off a whole year because as you know every year we wait cost per linear foot goes up or however they do it mm -hmm. and yep. uh, I'm 
I'm just throwing it out there that if it's worthy of a conversation for June for October town meeting I know I'd be willing to have a conversation I certainly don't want to circumvent our capital mm -hmm. we'd certainly bring them into the fold on this but if there is some way of having some you know, some benefit to the town that you see the pay me now or pay me later I'd rather pay them now at a significantly less cost than waiting a whole year if it's when you look at the picture of it the whole so big picture. Do we do we uh, through through the chair to Mr. Bauer? Do we foresee? Um, I think we foresee the construction. We're hopeful the construction will happen before the October fifteenth town meeting for this season, based on our conversation. And of course, I'm going to have to ask you to sit with him. Yeah, I'm sorry. I am sorry to catch a cold on this, but I saw you walking out. You, you were you almost out. I just want to make sure we get it. Uh, yeah, so we'll get this. I'm not sure that it would be a value for this construction season or not. I just don't know. I, I have to defer to the director. No, so this, this construction season is essentially underway. We're waiting, we're scheduling uh, in the next few weeks to have uh, what, what is essentially a two-part system. Um, we're going to have the first part done in the next couple of weeks, and then we wait a week and we come back and we do a top load on that. So this, this season, is, um, this season is, is pretty well taken care of. I think the discussion we had about paving, and we have a, we have a wonderful tool, the pavement management system that the, that the town invested in, is a, is a great foundation and when you analyze that data um, you know it may be I, I think it's something that at least the select board needs to be aware of uh, take a look at and it's something I can present in the future and I think what it lends itself to is sort of a pavement master plan and that tool we have is is just a foundation because it takes sort of a, a, an overall macro look at um, the condition of the pavement in the town when you look at and it assigns a dollar value to the improvements you need and that can be overwhelming. So I wouldn't want to alarm this board or the public as to what the overall financial implications of that, that plan is. But I think it, it's a good basis of a master plan, and I think that's what we need to look at. So as far as the next um, town meeting, I don't know that we need to jump in too quickly, or maybe I can work with the town administrator to, to you know, maybe develop a presentation that, that has potentially some financial implications, but maybe not. Maybe it's just an introduction to... Uh, a new program, a new way to look at the, uh, what we need for pavement in the future. So is there, yeah, is there a piece of technology that helps you do better evaluations and so on that we may want to acquire at FY19 to have a positive effect in 2020? There, there are different things we can do, and, and one of the things I talked about with the town administrator was um, sending the, the, the town engineer for some, some education on it. And there's, there's always these new, um, these new methods, means and methods to, to pavement. Um, you know, different roads and different conditions lend themselves to different methods and, and means and methods. So I think it's important for him and, and myself to be up to date on what those new uh, technologies are and things like that. So that's an obvious thing that we can do going forward. But, you know, I, I have to say the town made a great investment in that pavement management uh, system. And so we should continue to look at that and uh, making the best use of that as we can. But just in relation to October Town Meeting, if there's some modification to the um, road pavement program that needs to be done for the spring season, mm. October's the time to right. to make the modification. Right. Otherwise, you're waiting for the next fiscal year. Right. And so if there point. is so some sort of, uh, again, you know what's on the drawings right here. Point. Um, I'm certainly happy to, to, to make that presentation and make, uh, you know, I can work with the town administrator to develop that. Oh, well, with that we're not meeting be. again for a few more weeks, and we, we don't have to sign this until you said second meeting in September. Mm -hmm. So you get a little bit of time, but I certainly think that you two should discuss it, and if it's warrant to have a discussion with the capital team, then you should, you should do that mm -hmm. and then come back here and present it. But, you know, that's, I just wanted, that's the reason why I brought it up. Mm -hmm. you know, I know the season... It sort of gets a little break during the winter, but it kicks right back in. Oh yeah, in, you know well, April. And again, one of the other things that we talked about in relation to um, specifically the Swan Pond, but also yep. other areas of the community. Right. You know the, the um, unaccepted streets. I mean, if there is some other um, product available that we can utilize, which is better than what we're using now that washes away, and right. I think there are some. You know, maybe an appropriation to spread this sort of material as opposed to that material yeah. uh, for the spring season uh, would warrant an adjustment to the budget. I think you've seen those roads now, like Hancock Street, right? So yes. yes. When it's there, when so it's not there. <laughs> They're not there again. And not no, there. Yeah. Well, it sounds like as difficult as it is to 
you know, have the discussions about increasing the funding to these programs. I think the, the certainly the appetite of the board is there, and, and I think the public would, uh, would would welcome it. You know, there are definitely some some areas that need some attention. Yeah. Well, I think so, our public safety would welcome it too because yeah, they're certainly. going over those roads to try to provide services, and and, and, and we are obligated to, to maintain them. So we're we're putting you know good money after bad. But there, there's some, uh, you know, there are some other products which stand up better than what we're using. I yeah. think. It may not get to the level of you know, regular hot top, but if it's the reconstituted stuff um, that packs down well, right. it's uh, somewhat better than what we're using now. <coughs> but right. if it needs an additional appropriation to use that type of material as opposed to what we're using, well, let's let's take a look at that for the yeah. spring season. So right, you sure. have a homework assignment. No problem. Okay. Thank like, you. And then maybe we need a water. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to catch a cold, but thank you. Thank Ken. you. So nothing with the meters, you said. We're good no. on that. Okay. And then that's it. That's all I could think of. Any other board members? Are we missing anything? I think the two snow things could probably be consolidated at some point anyways. Well, Hope not only if they withdraw it. Right. They'd yeah. have to, they'd it's they'd out of our control. They'd have to get everybody no, they, they want to have a joint. Right. They, they want to. So, so one would be passed on. Sorry. Yeah. Hopefully this. I know. <laughs> Do we have a, are we proposing a figure for number 15? Um, or are we waiting to meet with him again? Or what's the story on that one? Do we have a figure? Um, oh, for the legal special we, counsel? I don't believe we have a figure. No, yeah, point, but we will by the time we meet. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't have a figure right now. I can't remember if he gave us one, honestly, going into He in gave us a projection. He did. Okay, but I, I just I'd rather it. vet it before. Yes. Yeah. Let's wait. I think there's, yeah, but yeah, there will actually, be enough. It's best to wait because depending upon how the depositions are going where and at. where we're right. at, and so That's a month is right. going to make a huge difference, could make a huge difference. Right. Okay. So if we don't have anything else on this, I'd like to go to the minutes and then the legal bills. And you have some things that you have or have not signed yet? All signed. Set it back here, we'll put it in the back. All right, mm -hmm. All right Mr. Chairman. I move to approve the July 23rd, 2018 regular session minutes. Second. second. Motion, I have a second by Mrs. Minupelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No, uh, opposed? Unanimous. Executive session. Let me see here. July 23rd. All right. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the July 23rd, 2018 executive session minutes as written. Second. A second by Mrs. Minupelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. August 7th, regular session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the August 7th, 2018 regular session minutes as written. Second. Yeah, motion is second by Mr. Schultz. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Approve legal bills. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills in the amount of $1,934 as follows. American Arbitration Association, $550. Department of Labor Relations, $500. Thompson West, $884. Total, $1,934. Second. A motion is second by Mr. Masseri. Mr. Chairman. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Gilbert. Mr. Chairman, there's a couple of bills in there for the Department of Labor Relations that uh, were just read off. Just to clarify, um, as I re referenced at the last meeting, things are very tight with the town council budget. We'll be paying these bills out of remaining funds in the town administrator's budget from fiscal year 2018 because they are fiscal year 2018 bills. Uh, but we're, we're not going to be paid out of town council. I just felt comfortable. I just felt I needed to identify that. They are legal related bills, and we felt the board should approve them before they were paid. Thank you. These are being paid out of town administrator expenses. Last year's budget. Fiscal year 18, correct. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I I can feel. Mr. Chairman, I apologize, I misspoke. The Ar American arbitration expenses will be paid out of last year's town administrator expense budget. The, the Department of Labor Relations was a fiscal year 19 bill, which can be paid out of town council. I misspoke, I apologize. Thank you for clarifying. We need to revote. Are we good? No, you're good. That doesn't change. The that vote. was just an explanation. All right. <laughs> uh, thank you for the clarification. 
Off the Kenny Field restrooms concession stand. Uh, looks like we have a payment to vote. Uh, there is a payment, however, we're going to ask the board to hold off on that payment because we are waiting on one final action, which is the seal coating of the property. It was scheduled to take place approximately two weeks ago, but the uh, damp weather prohibited it from occurring. Um, I was hoping I might have a timeline to report this evening for when it's going to be done, but I don't have one. It may have been done since I last spoke to the parks director last week, but I don't believe it has been. So we haven't, I have not heard a negative complaint or any issues or anything with that facility. I assume. It's all good? Pretty good. Because usually you're here. No, I'm no, it, it, It's functioning well. It, it is. I think it's we It's functioning have, we, very well. It's uh, they serving should be as well. And congratulated because well, we don't have a, usually have a project that goes with it. We're holding our breath because we did have some issues with the pavement, and I, I, my understanding is that it's been corrected to our satisfaction. Yeah. Um, we're waiting for the seal coating to be done, and when we, when we have a final certificate of yeah. occupancy and the last bill's paid, doesn't we'll concern celebrate. me that much. The facility and its functionals and its fantastic. Right? Oh, that's, it is fantastic. That's a wonderful thing. And it's not a portable. It's a wonderful thing. And it's a, uh, it's a great tribute to the committee that worked mm -hmm. to get that done and approved that contract. You certainly picked the right contractor to get the job done. They were the right people for the job. So I they think should be congratulated for that. And to piggyback on that, their patience and the patience of the whole town to rebid the project and to, to push the market to where we yep. needed to be, you know, yet again, it paid off for us to yep. do that. It's great teamwork. So, okay, so we're going to pass that over and we're going to go right to the town administrative report. Yes, sir. Bear with me for one moment as I'm slowly scrolling back to what you saw. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, we already spoke relative to the, the status of things with National Grid. Um, Secondly, West Nile virus has been detected in mosquitoes tested here in North Reading. Uh, they were tested from a sample taking in the Lindor Road area. A detailed advisory from the health department was released. Uh, it was attached to my report. Um, there are some preventative mechanisms that are in there that uh, we encourage the public to take a look at. Um, we continue to work with the state to monitor uh, the presence of any mosquito-borne illness here in town. Uh, secondly, a meeting to inform potential participants of changes in the Senior Tax Work-Off Program has been scheduled for Wednesday, September 12th at 10 o'clock a.m. here at Town Hall. We're going to be contacting, uh, we'll be, we, excuse me, we're inviting participants in the program to attend based on some changes approved at town meeting and the funding amount as well as the mechanism for compensation. So we hope that there'll be a lot of attendance here at that meeting. Uh, the town's housing production plan was approved by the State Department of Housing and Community Development, and a copy of that formal approval, approval notice was attached to my report. Um, and I just want to take a moment to recognize a, a number of new employees that have started with the town in recent weeks, um, mostly in the Department of Public Works. Um, some of these are positions that we have looked to fill for a number of um, years at this point, actually, and others uh, have been more recently uh, created vacant. The first is Nicholas Atwater, who is a building maintenance worker. Uh, he'll work under the supervision of Julie Spur Knight in the Department of Public Works maintaining facilities. That vacancy was created by virtue of Dean Luscombe, uh, who was the first person to hold that position when it was created. He will be and has transferred over to the Department of Public Works Highway Division. We welcome Stephen Lutterman as our new Geographic Information System Coordinator working under the Department of Public Works Engineering Division. Uh, that's a position we created more than two years ago, I think three years ago now at this point, and have struggled to fill. Uh, but we finally found Stephen, and he's here, um, and uh, he's uh, now three weeks in, I believe, to his work, and we're happy to have him on board. Um, the good is that we have the position. The bad is that there's a lot of work to do um, and that there may even need to be some updating of technology to take place, given how long we've been out of the business of GIS. Uh, here in Town Hall and been relying on contractors, but we'll bring any such requests forward through the appropriate funding process. But again, we welcome Stephen um, here to town. <coughs> I also want to welcome uh, Dan McMahon, who was a new heavy equipment operator in the Department of Public Works. Uh, he joined us um, on July 23rd. And finally, uh, we welcome uh, Special Heavy Equipment Operator Travis Luscombe, who is uh, working uh, now at the Department of Public Works as well. And if the name seems familiar, he is the brother of Dean Luscombe. <laughs> so we welcome uh, Travis as well. Um, again, a number of positions uh, in the Department of Public Works that have been vacant. Um, we hope to see uh, 
to see those faces around here in town hall to see them say hello uh, finally i, I want to offer the community just a quick update relative to the water meter program there's been quite a bit of communication that's taking place relative to the mailed postcards as i mentioned at the last meeting we had an issue with some postcards coming out representing that they were from the town of bill Rico, which needed to be corrected there were some advisories that went out to folks in the targeted area last week or the week before uh, that indicated that a final notice with the potential for water shutoff to take place uh, as we discussed at the board meeting in I believe June it's not our intention to shut off water although when we have finally made the full transition if there are remaining meters there may be a uh, special meter reading fee that we implement um, for any manual reads that have to take place but we are not going to be disconnecting people's water because they've not complied with the meter um, uh, the meter program at least that is not the intention at this point in time um, so that's just something I want to offer as a correction for anyone who may have seen it and become concerned. Um, with regard to the, uh, the meter program as well, they're moving by geographic area here in town. Um, so they've been focused on an area that's kind of close to the center of town, but they'll be uh, moving to other areas as well. And they've been kind of ramping up with a number of crews that they've had here in town. Um, through the contractor. We have had some issues with um, uh, individuals notifying us that appointments were scheduled and then were canceled, um, and that was partially due to discrepancies between our records and the actual size of um, the, the meters in the actual homes, but we hope that we'll be able to prevent that from uh, <coughs> continuing to take place. Um, Mr. O'Leary. Like Mr. Maseris, mine took 20 minutes last Wednesday, and they were on time. Great. And it took me longer to clear the corner out than it did for him to change the meter. Same with me. So clean, yeah. easy. <laughs> Ditto on that. Ditto. <laughs> I haven't called them yet. Yeah. He's going to be the one that's going to get the fine. I'm getting yeah. it to fine. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I, have a I just wanted to ask um, if you were done when will you finish with your. I'm done, yes. Because we talked so much about the CBD gummies, I don't want to give West Nile short shrift, and I wanted to know. If you could explain to people in the town who are a little bit nervous about it, what we're doing, are we increasing spraying? Obviously, the the advisory tells people what they can do, which is obvious. Mm -hmm. Obvious things: don't stay out at dusk unless you get red pollen on, or sure. wearing can we red just pollen. Maybe stay things. for the record. This is not Triple E. This is West Nile, and there's a big sure. difference between the two. I think so there's a little confusion in town about it. Th there may be yes. So uh, to first answer the question. Um, so West Nile virus obviously is a concern. It's more so a concern for those who might have a compromised uh, immune system. And I think in the advisory it indicates that individuals over 50 may be at potential risk as well. Um, but uh, we are a member of a regional mosquito control district. And that regional control, control district uh, does spraying in uh, the high risk areas. And we frequently put out the notices during the course of the summer to advise people. They do truck mounted spraying. They also do a, a baiting program where they put um, uh, material in our catch basins that prevent the breeding out of the uh, water that might remain at the bottom of the sump in the uh, catch basin. So that is an exercise that took place in the early part of the spring. But uh, we had um, more intensive spraying that is scheduled for tomorrow in and around um, affected areas here in town and that's going to continue through the rest of the summer. I think you know anybody who's been following along this is frequently the time of year when this type of notice comes up. Um, I guess the good news is it was a report of it being um, identified in a mosquito rather than a human case of it. So that certainly is, is something that we want to keep an eye on and avoid that. To the chairman's uh, point, um, uh, the, all of these mosquito-borne illnesses that may have an impact on an individual are concerning. Um, the triple E, um, Eastern uh, Equine Encephalitis, uh, that, that's something that brings with it uh, a significant uh, amount of um, greater concern. Um, again, there's concern for both, but there's greater concern for that. And depending upon where we're seeing it, uh, you know, there's the, the potential that it has a, a significant impact on recreational activity in town. So um, again, that's not the case here. Um, but the, uh, you know, should that ever become the case, the protocols are, are far more strict with regard to Triple E than they are with West Nile virus. Uh, but you know, the, the best advice is, especially in the dawn and dusk hours and with this fall activities now happening and organized sporting events taking place at dusk, mosquito repellent, wearing long uh, sleeve clothing. Um, we are going to be going through the spraying exercise uh, to the extent that, that we can, um, but you know, that is only as effective as the, the insects that it comes in contact with. Um, so we ask folks to you know, be mindful of their own personal uh, activities as well. 
did that address your question? Yes, Madam thank Chair? you. Yeah. Just one more from you, Kate. Um, you didn't bring it up, but I assume the federal partners audit went well. On August 7th? Yes. Um, I apologize. I thought I had written a blurb, but now I'm thinking I didn't read a blurb. Did I miss it? Uh, Did I miss it? No, you didn't. Uh, I, I Actually, I thought there were some minutes. That was my old new business. There were minutes, yes. That's why I didn't. Put, that's why I ended up not writing it, because there were minutes. That was my old new business. Still you should have. Uh, August 7th, I think it was. It was, it was on August 7th. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. So, yes, I, I mean, I have not heard a report, you know, meaning the final report of their presence here, but I, I know there was a very good conversation between um, the members of the board who were able to attend that morning. They met with our Youth Substance Coalition. I want to thank Marcy Bailey for taking them on a tour of town here with Amy Luckowitz. Um, but, um, you know, they, they are looking at us out of one of, as one of seven, I think, or nine of the hundreds of grants that are open nationwide. And they were particularly interested in the partnership with law enforcement that's been there between the coalition. And um, I think, you know, we've done a lot to support that, you know, even with where we physically have located the grant coordinator at this point over at the police department. So I, I think that we have um, a lot to contribute for people to see, particularly for communities of our size that might be interested. Um, and they were eager to hear it. Uh, one individual was here from Washington, D.C. One was here from uh, California, where he's a professor at the University of Southern California. And they were here uh, not only on the, um, not only for the Tuesday evaluation and for the National Night Out, but they were also here Wednesday as well for a meeting with the members of the community impact team. So. And, and uh, to add the uh, consultant <coughs> from the West Coast, university professor. I think it's the guy that's accumulating all the info. He's a project evaluator yeah. for yeah. the grant. Very good that's dialogue. Yeah. Which we should share in that report whenever it comes out. Great. Thank you for the collective update on that. Sure. Anything else? And no. now we should, you said thank you to Amy Lutzkowitz and Marcy Bailey did a tour. There were some of the members of the CIT that did a pretty lengthy tour around the town. And I was going to say something to her tonight, but I hadn't heard the audit results, so I said, no, maybe I won't. Well, there, <laughs> so. I think we're one out of, um, it seems like a multiple communities that they're amassing the data and information, but they, they did seem quite pleased about the efficacy of, of the efforts here. So, mm -hmm. And that really just the broad outreach of the CIT team and the youth services and the public safety director. So. It seemed like a pretty good dialogue. Yeah. They had really quite probably. a lot of questions for us. Anything Did else for you, Mrs. You want to? I'll, we may as well have you go. You good? good, Mr. Schultz. <laughs> I'm good, <laughs> Mr. Masseri. I think the uh, town administrator answered the question I was going to ask about the uh, water meters, and uh, I did say we are meeting on Wednesday. I think it's at 12:30. Yep. As a continuation of Great. water sewer trying to get the cost breakdown that they gave us, uh, the detail that got us to the total cost of sewer. And I've been working on the number, of, trying to get a, the number of users as part of the program to come up with some estimate of what the betterment cost might be. It's gonna be yeah, an gonna estimate. Be yeah. But I think we as a board need to It'd take that information in our hands and make some decisions about how we want to proceed. Great. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, again, I just wanted to mention, my water meter was put in, and again, I did it online, too, as far as making the appointment. It was very simple. Um, they kept to the schedule, and like I said, it took me a lot longer to clean out the yeah. area than it did to have it put in. Uh, the other thing is I just want to mention that I'm happy to see Kitty's open again. Um, again, great uh, Me members of the business community, great residents of the community for a long time, and. Um, they ran into a tough patch there and were able to survive five weeks of closure, which I'm not so sure many businesses would have been able to do. And um, in their cooperative efforts with the uh, health department, and uh, they're up and running and have been there three times since they opened last Saturday. So, and uh, happy for all those employees that are back to work. 135 employees and all back to work. So it's a good thing, and congratulations for them for first of all being able to survive it all, but um, working cooperatively with the health department to make sure that. Uh, all issues need to be addressed, and they have been, and um, that's great. That's so just I'm, happy I'm to happy see them that. open again. It is great. Great for the community to have them open again. 
I will just, I wanted to make sure everyone knows that children are going back to school, so it's that time of year where uh, you got to be a little more aware driving around and be prepared for that morning traffic. But um, this is our last meeting in our casual dress, I believe, right? Well, what? I don't care. <laughs> I like this dress. I kind of like I it. I would take a motion right now to do it for the rest of the year, but Just I don't be know. yourself. <laughs> Not that sweater, though. You cannot no, no, wear no. that sweater ever again. <laughs> that oh, it's coming. Be part of it's the coming. <laughs> that would be part of the motion. That would be an exclusion. <laughs> and um, our next meeting is? It's a Thursday. It's a September Thursday. I want to make sure everybody. I think we're in, co in oh. conflict with Thursday night football, unfortunately. But uh, we are on a Thursday evening. Thursday yep. of Labor Day oh. week. September 6th. Um, yep. So that's just and a common interest. in the morning, so do not keep me here late because I have a flight to catch. All right, um, Mr. Chairman, just on your comment, uh, yeah. one thing I'll note, it's not necessarily um, the purview of, of uh, the board, but there has been a change in the traffic routing at the drop-off at the Bachelor School, and uh, that certainly does, you know, an area that creates a daily disruption to the flow of traffic through the uh, town center. So uh, I know there's been communication with the families uh, that go to the school, but uh, just for the public, uh, there will still be a closure of Haverhill Street between Park Street uh, and the uh, top of the common, but the traffic's going to be routed in the opposite direction. So instead of dropping off, entering from Haverhill Street and traveling up Peabody Street, they'll be dropping off, entering from Peabody Street, Street and exiting out Haverhill Street. And hopefully one of the benefits will be any southbound traffic will now be able to turn onto Haverhill Street and pass nice. through the intersection, so that should lessen some of the stress on Bow Street in front of the library. How is that being communicated with the potential uh, you're parents. Gonna see, you're gonna see Sean Colleen out there. Yeah, it's been uh, it's <laughs> been communicated uh, last Thursday, I believe. Uh, there are maps on the community uh, connection that kind of show the arrows of where to go. Any traffic uh, cops or I'm sorry. Any traffic extra so personnel so out there? Th I'm sure that they'll do what they normally do on the first day of school. But in terms of the the impact on the traveling public not going to the school, there's no change other than maybe less volume on Bow Street. But yeah. the traffic will still need to reroute at the traffic light going northbound. And it's more the southbound traffic that will be the issue. Um, needs to go by the library, turn right on Park Street, turn left in the center of town, mm -hmm. or take whatever other alternate route. Samantha Kelly? The superintendent sent out a, an email notification to the parents. So. Mm. Great. And I had one more. Go just right ahead. You have plenty of time. <laughs> Well, I'll take a motion to adjourn if we don't have any other business. Motion to adjourn. Okay, a motion. Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. All in favor? Aye. Aye.